That's what we need to do. Good evening, Mr. Help Desk Valdez. Aha! Look at this. Look at this puppy. So where is it at right now? It is inbound to Kerbin. And you've got a couple maneuver nodes. You've got 746 Delta V. It says 866 in the tank. The thrust weight's 0.92. Uh, but we're a little bit past the time of this node. It looks like we got it. It looks like we got it. Just review for this. I'm, I'm figuring out what the problem is being solved right now. So we're looking at the spacecraft, but uh, I can always load that persistent file again. Or I could uh, alt... Okay, um, that works. Or I could alt, uh, alt F9 right here. Let's just do that. Alt F5, I mean. And we'll say... Begin! Like that. Alright, cool. That looks good. Alright, so, uh... <laughs> there are some Kerbals aboard this craft. And this craft seems to be inbound from somewhere. It, it, I mean, it's got an Apo out near Elu. Is this craft coming back from Elu? Or was it coming back from somewhere else? Because I see Elu there, and I see an Apo near Elu. But the inclination doesn't make me think Elu. I don't know. No, I'm, no, I'm not gonna give you no, neon heat. I'm not gonna give you. I'm not gonna give you trouble on that. Everything I say will will be in jest. I'm I'm absolutely not gonna give you trouble for how you've designed your ship or anything. I'll give you some some feedback on how you could get more delta v or whatever. But I'm not. Oh my gosh, it moves. Okay, we're good. Um. So, anyways, is it? Uh, it's mission elapsed time is 18 years. <laughs> it's mission elapsed time 18 years. Wow. And it's inbound. You were trying to set up a maneuver here. Does it have a Kerbin? Does it have a, a, a Kerbin uh, intercept yet? It's close to Kerbin, but it doesn't have a Kerbin intercept. What's our descending node? Zero point zero. Okay, so there is a ship that is inbound to Kerbin, and right now it is not intercepting Kerbin. It is missing Kerbin. Its closest approach is five point five million kilometers. Uh, in 413 days. So it is not getting here in a hurry. It was orbiting Jewel. You were flying another ship, and during warp, you think Lathe or another moon kicked it out. Ah. Okay. Gotcha. It was orbiting Jewel, and it might have got gravity gravity chunked out. Um, the good news is the descending node... Do we have Kerbin? Yeah, we do have Kerbin set as the target. So the good news is the descending node is zero, so it's, it's on seemingly roughly the same inclination as Kerbin, which is a good place to start, right? It isn't out here at the apoapsis. That apoapsis is six years away. Oh, but that's the that's the apoapsis. That's not where you were. It's one year, 27 days to the periapsis. So let's go and see. Uh, we need to know when this craft needs to arrive by. Because I believe you said there's a contract. It's got tourists on board. And there is some sort of... <laughs> I'm leaving it. There's some sort of contract uh -huh. going. Should be an active contract. Is this it? Ferry three tourists safely to their destination. So its deadline is six years, 264 days. So we've got six years to get them home? Okay. We've got six years to get them home. You can get it as far as getting a rescue ship docked to it while it has a close pass to Kerbin, but never been able to get it to re-enter safely, partly as your center of gravity is not great. Ah, Okay. All right, so we have three Kerbals, and I, I assume there are actually crew along on the ship as well, or a probe core or something that's going to let us control the ship, right? And you have to get them back down to the surface of Kerbin in the next six years, 264 days. So it's not like we have 20 days or anything. That's, I, feel, I feel better about that, right? So we're going to want to try to capture this thing in low Kerbin orbit, and uh, you can tell me... You can tell me what your... Uh, Completion. Complete, 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 complete. You have one Kerbal who isn't going to... They haven't been to Duna yet. Because this is incomplete. So are you trying to get that Kerbal to Duna? I mean, you could do it. You got six years. But are you trying to also get that Kerbal to Duna? Because that stage is incomplete right there. This one says incomplete, but that's because they haven't been returned safely yet. But that, that's a, a little bit of a trick. That they did not do atmospheric flight on Duna. This is a crazy, this is, fly by Eve. 
<laughs> orbit the sun, which if you're flying by Eve, you're going to end up orbiting the sun. Uh, fly by the sun, and it's... So one tourist wanted to go to Duna, and one tourist wanted to go to Eve? <laughs> what compelled you to accept this contract? <laughs> Swing by Duna on the way back, right? Hope the reward for this contract was ridiculous. <laughs> so if center gravity were better, you could do a hot reentry, but you always lose it at like 30k. Let's go back and have a look at the ship, right? And the ship has limited delta V, but we have six years in change. And uh, as a base, where's Duna at right now? Duna is getting to the point where it might be in a good position for a transfer. I don't know that we'll go that far, but it would be a good excuse to teach an interplanetary transfer, I guess. Um, let's go and look at this thing and check this ship out. Let's see what we get from the ship. You must have missed that. You say landed. He can go on a trick trip to Duna on a different launch. You should still have him in your space program, right? Like, if you... I've never brought back a tourist who hasn't completed all their things. It doesn't, like, delete the tourist or anything. So do we have a heat shield? Yes, that is a part of a heat shield. And you've actually got a heat shield with full ablator. So you lost a little bit of ablator on the launch or something like that. But you do have a heat shield in there. Um, I can tell you right now, this is probably not particularly aerodynamically stable without the heat shield. Uh, or sorry, without the, the stage here. Is this a lander? <laughs> it's a lander. It, it, has, it has legs on it. It's a lander. Interesting. All right, that's cool. That's fine. Um, but this, the stack with a heat shield like this, it probably doesn't like this thing re-entering just because the stack is so tall. This is a cargo bay. Yeah, that's a service bay. Anything in it? Some science experiments and stuff. There's a probe. Nope, that's an experiment container. That's a goo. It's got thermometers and, uh, is that a little monoprop? Yeah, that's a little monoprop there. Okay. Um, and it has some fuel as well, but not much fuel. It's only got 866 Delta V. Okay, dokie. And what else do we need to know? It's only got 38.99 monoprop, which really isn't anything to sneeze at. So we want to get this thing captured at Kerbin, and I guarantee you it's not going to be able to capture at Kerbin. It does have Jeb and Bob and Bill, and then it's got Kentop and Pachian and Ronpont. Ropont. <laughs> So, we know that it's inbound to Kerbin. We know that we're missing Kerbin. And we know that if we needed to intersect Kerbin, we need to do it sooner rather than later. I'm curious, how close to Duna is it getting? It's nowhere near close to Duna, so it's not like we can just, like, go to Duna and then gravity assist off Ike to try and fly back to Kerbin. Um, so it's not anywhere, I mean, it's way off from Duna. So let's set Kerbin as the target again. And so you already had this set up. You already had a maneuver node here, and you did the right thing because you you were doing something to try and use your delta v to get your pass by Kerbin, right? And it's going to be a pretty high energy pass. But let's let's see what we can do to get a little bit closer to Kerbin. We'll play around with some different trajectories um, here. In this, I'm going to explain this for everybody, right? So when I'm talking about it, I'm not just talking to you, Neon. I know you probably know some of this stuff. But uh, when you're on a trajectory like this, it's always cheaper to change your orbit out here, right? Remember when we were talking about the inclination changes and I was illustrating how you can uh, you can change your inclination and it's a lot of the times cheaper or it's always cheaper to change your inclination when you have like a really elliptical orbit that has a really high apoapsis. And we were looking at, well, what if I increase my apoapsis and make it elliptical and then do the inclination change at apoapsis? And remember that was because the slower your ship is moving relative to whatever, the cheaper a maneuver which deflects your trajectory somehow is, right? So if you're way up here at the apoapsis, your orbital velocity would be really slow, and it would be super cheap to change a trajectory up here and get that encounter with Kerbin. We're more than halfway down, so our orbital velocity is already picking up quite a bit. And so since we've, I'm not even going to say waited this long, right? But since... This is the situation the craft is in. It's not going to be as efficient for us to, to make this maneuver. Uh, but we got to get it done, right? So let's see what we can do. Let's just see if we can put it a, a little bit out. And how close? That's a day out. That's three hours out. Two hours. That's fine. Let's just add a maneuver right there. And I want to get over here and look at Kerbin. I could probably focus my view on Kerbin. Yep. And go to the maneuver editor, and let's see what we can do. 
So there's docking mode, toggle map, maneuver mode. That's what I wanted. And go to the maneuver like that. So we're coming in ahead of Kerbin. That means that we need to get here a little bit slower. We need Kerbin to have time to catch up to us. And we'll look which way of these is cheaper. Um, one thing that we can do is we can try to slow down and see if we can get here when Kerbin does this. I don't know that that's going to work, but we'll play around with it, right? So if possible, we could slow our trajectory down and basically buy ourselves time or buy Kerbin time to sort of catch up to us, right? Let's look at that and see how much Delta V that'll cost. And the other thing that we can do is try to deflect the trajectory, but we'll just, we'll figure out which one it is. The way I got to this point is you quick save multiple times, you even out your inclination out there, and that's part of the way you burnt through so much time. Ah, that's why we're right after the descending node. So we noticed that the descending node was zero, so you've matched planes, you've matched inclinations with Kerbin, but you, uh, that's, that's where we're right there. You've just finished doing that, I guess, right? This is like four mistaken quick saves deep. Well, you wouldn't need me then, right? I'm fine with it. Let's, let's keep looking at it. Um, so let's grab this and just try to slow down, right? I'm literally just going to tell it to go retrograde and see how quickly this affects it. And it may not be a very good way to do it at all, but we'll see. So if I want to get a Kerbin encounter, I can slow down and look at that. I'm going to get that encounter is going to pop. And there I got an encounter for 655 Delta V by just slowing down. How close is the encounter? The encounter is out there at Elu, but let's keep let's keep doing this and say go retrograde a little bit more. I can get inside the moon. I mean, that's actually looking great. Let's scale that down just a little bit. And we can grab it right here. I don't want it to be too close to Kerbin. If I get it a little bit further away from Kerbin, it'll have less of a gravity slingshot effect on Kerbin. So putting this up here at 1.5 million is fine. Uh, maybe we'd put it down to 1.0, like a million meters. So let's have a look. Yeah, 115 is fine. It's, I almost want to delete this vessel or like deorbit this vessel so it's not in the way, right? At the descending node, you said, well, I'm out of ideas. <laughs> nice. So we'll write this down. If it's uh, retro only, then it's 660, right? And can I see an encounter? I guess I'm not going to really be able to see what my velocity would be down there. If we get off of this, that tells me we're getting there in 420 days. I don't believe there's anything that's going to allow me to see my velocity at that point. We would have to focus off of this craft. Let's go back to this craft and see what this... Nope, that's not going to show a velocity differential either. Because it's not an encounter with a ship. It's an encounter with a planet. Using a rescue ship to rendezvous with the inbound. That's what we're going to do. Loopy, that's the same thing we were doing in my ultra hardcore career save. Where we were doing rescue missions by punting them from Elu, or sorry, not from Elu, from Minmus, and then we were catching them in low curve in orbit. And we would send up the tug system, and the tug would speed up and rendezvous with it, and then catch it and then slow it down again, right? You did not know to approach your pro approach periaps is so high, you're putting your approach low, and you guess getting slingshotted pretty hard. Your your velocity would be faster if you were further out, because you'd be falling towards Kerbin. Um, so if you if you send it down to like 80 or something like that, it's gonna speed the craft up even more. But uh, either way, I mean, either way, we need a craft that's going to meet up with it. But, Loopy, you're exactly right. That's my plan here. The exact same phasing rendezvous that we use in Ultra Hardcore Career for rescues, uh, inbound to stations. So if we're coming from outside of the SOI and we're trying to just do a direct rendezvous with a station from outside, uh, it's just going to be a two-node phasing rendezvous like we always do. So let's see. That was 660. That's what I was writing down. So let's change this. And how do I edit the maneuver node again? Oh yeah, you gotta click on that. Then you gotta click on that. And we'll set that back to zero and undo the maneuver. So could I get by with less delta V by deflecting my trajectory in? And I don't know if this is going to work or not, but we'll see. I'm just going to focus my view on that. And instead of going slowing down, I'm gonna try radial in. And I don't know that in this point of the orbit, Nope. Radial in won't work here because we're not buying any time. You see that? 
as I try to radial in, my velocity down towards the inner solar system is still the same. And so I'm not going to meet up with Kerbin by trying to just do radial in. Let's We could try radial out. Let's see if we can do radial out. But radial isn't really going to change our velocity relative to the sun. So it's unlikely that we would be able to catch up. See that? Even that right there in this situation, that gets us within 2.5, but that's 400 delta V. And I don't know... Well, we might be able to do it for cheaper. So there's one for 570. That's 100 delta V cheaper. That's one year, 69 days instead of 420. So this one, I may be able to actually play with this some because we got the encounter and we're, sh we're shipping the encounter for 90 less delta V. At the end of the day, what good is that going to do us, I guess, is the question. Like, do we want to get there sooner? I think we might want to get there sooner. Let's have a look. It's actually it's actually retrograde, isn't it? Which way are we coming in? No, that's prograde. That's prograde. But <laughs> we we could slingshot off the moon. That's a thing. I'll set this back. Whoa, okay, that's crashing into Kerbin. Just do a direct re-entry like straight in like that. <laughs> There's one million meters like that. And won't that have a slower rendezvous speed due, be due, due to being further out? Um, let's see. The other thing we could look at is how much it takes to actually capture here. Because that, we could use that to figure out what our inbound velocity is, right? So that was 570. No, I'm looking at that wrong. That is definitely retrograde. Yeah, I was looking at that wrong. It needs to be on the other side of the planet. Let's delete that thing and switch back over to here. Is that prograde? That's prograde right there. That's what we want. And send it back up to a million meters. There you go, million meters. All right, you tried direct entry. That was your preference, but it's impossible. <laughs> if the solution is going to be a prograde burn to speed up, I'm going to laugh. <laughs> I, I don't think the solution is going to be a prograde burn to speed up. I'm pretty sure that's not the case. I'm, I'm trying to just dial it down to... Uh, as close to 995, that's pretty good. So what would it cost me to capture here? Add maneuver in one year and 70 days. So this is almost almost 100 days more. And I'm super curious. Oh, wow. Look at that moon slingshot to free return. <laughs> that's interesting. That's an escape. How about them apples? Oh, no way. No way. It, I, it can't do this because we don't have enough Delta V. But that is a... That is using the moon to capture it Kerbin. Well, actually, I don't know. Are we completely capturing... Actually, that may not be using the moon because the moon just got in the way there. Um, but that comes down to a to a re-entry there at a... It's still way outside of Minimus. It's still way outside Minimus. So that's still a very high energy return, right? That's still nothing to sneeze at. And this, this maneuver is 1,500 delta V. So not... Yeah. Not something that I think we would want to do there. But uh, let's have a look. It's something we can do. It is something that is possible. Can we swing around this way? That's crashing into the moon. <laughs> no way. That's still crashing into the moon. But that's almost down to Minmus's orbit. What? And then that's a straight lunar slingshot that slings you out of the solar system. Right? Right? So that's still 1398 uh, to to do this maneuver to have the moon basically throw you away. And I don't think I wonder. That's still not a capture if we don't slow down enough. 
so the moon isn't really going to let this happen. Remember, if you're, if you're passing in front of the moon, it'll usually slow you down a little bit. If you're passing behind the moon, it'll usually slingshot you forward a little bit. So we would be passing in front of the moon here, but I, I don't know that we're going to be able to do anything. The good news is this node is only 1,400 delta V, and we can definitely get a craft in orbit that can carry 1,400 delta V. Our speed is like 2,500 above capture. Our speed is probably around 1,500 above capture because this node right here, let's just go ahead and look at it. It's not going to be 1,500 because we had the... <laughs> the moon is in just the right position with this. <laughs> that's not that's not really anything that's not going to be that useful to us but here if we did an actual circular capture i want to see what the delta v requirement is going to be oh oops i also need to put it back on the apoapsis like that was that 993 that's close enough for me so how much delta v is that that's 2200 so it is it's not 2500 but it is 2200 if we want to do this whole thing um what is our minimum to capture? So to stay in the Kerbin system and not go slinging by, what's our minimum to actually capture? I want to look at that. These are just numbers. We're just collating data, right? Uh, it's it's 2,200 to get all the way back to that capture. But look at this. To have a shy of the moon capture, I believe that would be outside of the SOI of the moon. We'd look, we could look it up. But uh, that's only 1,750, right? This rocket is not going to have enough delta V, even with a gravity assist from the moon. I, I don't see any way that this rocket would be able to just do a straight-up gravity capture. Um, but let's go a little bit more, because it looks like... I mean, look at that. That's flying by the moon. 1677, so probably 1700 is where we want to be. Um, what if we miss the moon completely here? That's almost too good. I mean, that is almost too good to be true, y'all. <laughs> no worries. No neon heat disease. I, it's it's a cool problem. Um, it's a cool problem to look at. But look at this. With this, I, I'm scared of the lunar flyby because you know Kerbal has trouble calculating out accurately in the future. And so something that looks right here in theory, when we actually do the flyby of the moon, it may not work out this way. So to bet the entire farm on the moon, the lunar gravity doing something for us, may not be the, the greatest idea in the world, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how much delta that was 17. That was 1571. What's our minimum? Like, we got to get captured. It's hilarious that it sort of goes to the moon. There's the moon. Still slingshotting it, but none of this is actually going to capture us. That is us crashing into the moon, so that's not an option. And then there is us literally going through the center of the moon and then slinging down the bottom, right? Um, I think we'll just say 1,700. That is... 1300 and 1300 slings us out because of the lunar gravity assist i i don't think that 1300 would even capture us here so one more thing i want to look at uh what if we we'll we'll build for 2000 right because we know or we should build for 3000 if we can but we know that if we have 2000 we can probably capture if we have 2200 we can almost go into a circular orbit but uh if we have 2000 we should be able to pretty realistically capture right go back to the slowdown idea we do the slowdown idea yeah we can look at the slowdown idea as well let's let's go and try the slowdown idea and i should have just edited that first maneuver node but i'll just put it as close as i can here oh my gosh i gotta focus on the craft loopy you're into that with your jewel probe you're trying to change gravity assist to get all five moons one that shows up wasn't reported that's what happens we've done the crazy rosetta uh, gravity only capture at jewel where we sent a mission to jewel and we just did the tylo to lathe or whatever uh, gravity assists we did and, and it was like a rosetta that did a flyby of a jewel to a capture using only gravity assists right i don't think we need that here but uh let's go back to the one that was 660 for the encounter with kerbin and we got to set kerbin as the target again and honestly i could probably just type in like negative 660 and it would probably give me a kerbin encounter like that so we've got that going for us um can i focus the view without destroying everything yeah so if we do this, <laughs> that's cool. 
If we do this, how much does it cost us to capture if we just do the slowdown thing? This is 421 days before we get there. I would expect this... Well, I don't know. Let's actually see what we get. Didn't get the moon in there anywhere. <laughs> it's 5,000 Delta V. <laughs> Dude. What? Jeebus? Jeebus? Is, is that your name? Jeebus, Welcome thank you for gifting the subs the there. Appreciate the 10 gifted subs. It's going to play the notifier 10 times. And Welcome I'm going to appreciate to you very much. Thank you so much for that. Y'all, put some hearts in chat. Jeebus just gifted a sub to Jandra, uh, to J South, to Atom, Atom, Atomataj, Atom Montage, I guess. Sky Captain, Escape Pods, Chips Gaming Chips, Welcome Aerospace UK, Caviar Liberata, Dead, and Old Rumsey all got gifted subs. Appreciate it. I Welcome do appreciate the ten the gifted account. subs, Jeebus. And then, and then Jeebus actually subbed with Twitch Prime as well. Thank you for the support. Back this is my account. job. This is what I do for a living. Um, which is wacky, right? It's like we're playing a video game, but I, I am able to do this Welcome because of your support. Um, people watching the stream and people hanging out and tips and subs and gifted subs and... Welcome back to the Academy. I'm going to shut up now, <laughs> but I appreciate you. <laughs> For real, y'all. Try to, to get banned, Academy. just spam that stuff in there. Spam the stuff in there. Because the angle you're crossing the orbit, you're not getting Kerbin's full speed working Welcome for you. You're going in an angle and we get like half the velocity helping. Yeah, we are crossing it as opposed Welcome to meeting it. To we are crossing it as opposed to meeting it. So what we want to do to optimize this is try to meet Kerbin at our periapsis over here somehow. If this is your job, you need to go to work more. <laughs> so this is going to be way too much Delta V. 5,000 Delta V to capture this way. We are just, we're just not even going to load that up because that's crazy talk, right? So let's go back over here and slam down the maneuver node. Three days is fine as well. Let's add the maneuver, and let's see if we can catch Kerbin at the very edge of the orbit here, right? Like this. Like that. I thought it worked for NASA Space Lab. I helped NASA Space Lab with their live streams, Flask. Um, I don't, it's not like they pay me you know, a monthly salary or anything like that, but uh, I work with NASA Space Flight for sure. <laughs> um, so we're going to try to meet Kerbin out here. We're going to want to do a little bit of radial out and a little bit of slowing down and see how close we can get that radial out slowing down and see that's close I don't know that we want to really really go too far with this what's our approach five three fifty nine I mean, there's an approach, 527. It'd be even better if we didn't cross the orbit, right? It'd be even better if we if we met it all the way over here at the periapsis. So let's let's see if we can keep pushing that. I'm just a little bit concerned that it's going to cost more delta V. Well, here's the thing to do. Let's get this encounter going, right? There was a moon, or that was a oh, that was a minimus encounter. What? <laughs> this is not normal for the the Kerbin system. There's the moon. Huh. Interesting. There is us crashing into Kerbin. All right, that's about good. One point eight. One point one. Government work, right? Who's paying for this? Nine nine three. All right, I like it. So, what would this cost us to capture? And let's just go for like a circular capture, right? Nine and three. One, two. I mean, that's a happy capture for me. That's till two, three, eight, nine to do it that way. Two, three, eight, nine. I don't love it. Let's uh, let's back it off a little bit more. Let's see if we can meet it a little bit further out here, right? Why nine and three? Uh, Neon, I'm just I'm just shooting for a million. I'm I'm shooting for a thousand kilometers, so it's just a number to shoot for, basically. Um, I think the last time we did tons of radio, right? How about a capture right at seventy-one kilometers? You want to look at that? 
we can look at it real quick. Let's go look. So we'll focus back on this. And I'll edit that first maneuver node so that we capture all the way down at 70. Like, well, not 71 because we're going to try and do a rendezvous, but let's do like a buck 20 or something. Buck 15, 176, 54, no. 238. Let's try it lower. Let's not try it that high because I need some room to work, right? So we'll do that. We'll add a maneuver in. How much does it cost to capture here? Come on, Overth, work with us. That basic capture is 1500 and that's a capture way inside of Minmus. And to get all the way down to circular down here, what does this cost us? 2310. So not a huge difference, um, but we do get the actual basic capture at... I want to get it inside of Minmus a little bit. That maneuver would cost me 1500 if we do it that way. So 1500 versus let's put it up higher and just see the difference, right? Go over here, back to my maneuver, and put this back up at a million, like that. And it's just, it's another number because I'm going to have the rescue craft meet it, right? So it's just, a, it's just a round number or something that we're just picking. And just the basic capture here, how much Oberth do we get? Hello, the moon, again. Put this up so it's just inside Minmus's orbit. Because Minmus, I mean, it's 14 days down from Minmus, so it's not that big of a deal. That's 1,800. So with all of these things, it does save us some, right? It's no different on the other side of Kerbin, since it's essentially radial. Uh, on the other side of Kerbin, you mean coming in on the, the inside, like between Kerbin and the sun? Or what do you mean by that? The other side of Kerbin. 154 kilometers, nice. What was the difference? It was 1,800. And if we got rid of this maneuver and we looked at uh, this, back to there, send it down to a buck 238. This basic capture was cheaper, I think, right? 1,400. I, I mean, that's a significant amount of Delta V. This is periapsis at the sunrise size, but you could also choose the sunset side. You mean over on, on this side, right? I believe, so So the game doesn't really help us here, because this won't be the, uh, it won't be the, the Terminators, it, it won't be the day-night line whenever we're doing this maneuver, because I expect that we should be seeing this, because the encounter's over here, and I think that that encounter would actually be on the night side of Kerbin, right? Because the Kerbin's actually going to move around its orbit and end up over there, and this should be the night side of Kerbin with the periapsis when we actually do it. You, you can't look ahead. Coming rescue shade shouldn't change much because it'll make it harder for the rescue ship. That's right, Teague. So I was I wanted it to be on the prograde side because when I launch the rescue ship, I want the rescue ship to go into an orbit like this, right? And uh, the rescue ship, I literally just want to... Uh, I want to launch prograde, basically, for the rescue ship. I think this works. I mean, it's 534 for the initial maneuver, and then it's 1488 to capture. How dangerous would an air break no lower than 45 or 59? Shady, we could try a bunch of different stuff there. I don't believe that given the design of this craft, we, we could aero capture it safely. I don't, I don't know that we could go deep enough in the atmosphere. In in the neon, if you have, if you have any, if you've tried this, we could try it, right? We could try to send it through the atmosphere and see how deep in the atmosphere we would need to go to get slowed down enough. But neon was saying that it wasn't stable on reentry, so I don't, uh, I don't know that it would be an option for us to do that. You know, let's go look at the ship real quick. I mean, you could burn all of your Delta V just straight retrograde out of that. You're sitting on 866, you've got 534, so you're looking at 330 Delta V. And could you get the remaining 1100, 1200 Delta V out of an aero capture? Maybe? I don't know that it's going to stabilize. You can live to about 65k any deeper in your roast, 
What's the, uh, what's the, what's the thing? What's the behavior there? What's the behavior on that? Is it, it goes sideways and melts, or the heat shield fails, or what happens with it, right? I think that it could survive if it was just this pod with the heat shield. I, I think it would survive just fine, right? Um, could you do something like dock an inflatable heat shield to the claw on top to make, help it be stable in ascent? If we were going to do that, we would have to meet it in advance. So we would have to get there and dock to it before it actually passes periapsis. It wouldn't necessarily have to have an atmospheric interface at periapsis because whatever you dock to it could also bring it down to, to have a periapsis in the atmosphere with one of the big heat shields. If they're unlocked, I don't actually know if those are unlocked. Um, it may be really difficult to stabilize this craft with a big heat shield on it as well. There'd probably be a lot of guest test and revise on that because it's a taller craft. And remember, the big heat shield is not designed to, to slow down taller crafts. Uh, the big heat shield is designed to have a, a craft sort of tucked into it. So you're talking about the, the heat shield that looks like this, right? And the design of that, after the original NASA designs, really only expects to have a craft like this. And so we've built craft that are bigger, but it tends not to want to stabilize if the craft is too big behind it because of the center of pressure versus center of mass balance, right? Uh, the massive heat shield has tons of drag. It's, it's even not even really of a heat shield. It's more of a drag shield. And this heat shield works because of its massive amounts of drag. But that puts your center of pressure really far up to the front. And if you have a ship docked to the back of it, the center of mass is going to be behind the center of pressure. And if you get too far behind the center of pressure, you get into situations where it might flip out. If you wanted to try that and modify the ship... What we did was we actually added double heat shields. <laughs> so we put a heat shield on the front and we put another heat shield on the back and that actually stabilized it so that the center of drag was behind the center of pressure and it stayed stable at these insane, that was a moho mission that we were coming back on. And so you could dock a heat shield to the front and dock a tail heat shield to the back to keep that center of pressure back doesn't really work in real life that way right that sort of game of <laughs> using the Kerbal mechanics to to make things work ways they wouldn't work in real life it controls till you run out of flu fuel then it flips and roasts how much electric charge do you have 335 electric charge so you're using the reaction wheel on this let's open this up there's not really any reaction wheel in there because i don't see a probe core is that a scanning arm? That's a scanning arm. Nice. Unless there's a probe core clipped somewhere. But even a probe core reaction wheel wouldn't be very powerful. You just have the, what is it, 7 or 15 or, or whatever the power of this reaction wheel and this is. Um, the poodle does gimbal, but I would expect the poodle to be offline, right? You're probably talking about uh, RCS. So once it runs out of the 40, the 38, 39 monoprop you have, it's probably also using that monoprop to try and stabilize. I bet you. And then when it runs out of monoprop, that may be the fuel you were talking about, not the fuel down here. It's not an electric charge problem. It's a, it's a monopropellant problem, right? I... <laughs> there might be a probe under the advanced grabbing unit. Let's have a look. No, I, I'm not seeing one unless it's super skinny somewhere. You didn't, uh... Did you try to re-enter with this? Open? I'd need to remember, but I believe the claw is one of the parts that actually increases its drag uh, when it's deployed versus undeployed. I wonder if the extra drag from the claw would help you maintain stability during re-entry. I mean, heck! You might be able to just dock a big heat shield to the claw and use it to marry Poppins your way down. What if that was the solution? What if the solution was to take something up there that has a heat shield on it and dock a big heat shield so it's like a... It's like a... a, a what's the right way? A, a shuttlecock. Like, like a badminton thing. Because <laughs> you have the heat shield down here, and then you'd have the drag shield in the back. I wonder if that would work. 
I wonder if that would work. I don't know. I don't know that I would certify that for hard mode career. Because you are going to get an awful lot of drag on this. And given the mass and drag of this, it may actually rip this connection apart. That would be my big concern. You could always cheat. You could auto shred it or something like that, right? I mean, I say cheat. It wouldn't be cheating because it's your scenario. Um, but now I'm thinking. I'm thinking about it in times of. Uh, I'm thinking about it in terms of ultra hardcore career, which isn't what I need to think about it in. There's no probe core. It has no probe icon on it in the comnet. Gotcha. It just says the Kerbal up there. Yeah, it doesn't look like it has a signal either right now. But there's Kerbals on board, so that's fine. Um, I mean, you can just claw it to the inside of a big disposable cargo bay, then bail out once through once you're through re-entry. Hmm. You could. You could also design a cargo bay that had the heat shields on it and then deploy the heat shields out and, and use the cargo bay to help protect the main craft. In ultra, So in, in my ultra-hardcore career... This is rough. Um, I would not have certified this to fly in Ultra Hardcore because it doesn't have a docking port and it's carrying tourists. So that was something that we talked through when I was designing tourist mission in Hardcore. We said, if you have a tourist mission, you need to have a way to rescue the tourists off of the craft in case there was a thing. And by our rules, we wouldn't, we wouldn't send Kerbals through a claw. Technically, it would allow us to claw to another craft, and then we could transfer the tourists through the claw, and we could put them in a rescue craft, and we could completely throw this craft away, and then we could have them, like, glide down on the space shuttle or something, whatever they wanted to do after they were captured. But, uh, I mean, eh. It's interesting. Hey, Seth Kirk, how you doing? What are you up to? I think, I think all of those things would work. Um... That heat shield is going to block fuel, so we can't just dock a fuel tank to it. So one bit of weirdness would be... We're not docking to it. The rescue ship... It's like a rescue tug, basically. And the rescue tug could attach to it and go... You would claw an EVA transfer. Tourist can't EVA is the reason that we... We wouldn't do it. And you can transfer a tourist through a claw connection. The game lets you do that. Um, when we were building craft for Hardcore Career, we wouldn't allow them to transfer through a claw. We said you need to design a hatch for the Kerbals to go through, right? Tourism EVA costs extra. Nice. <laughs> Unless you're pretending they EVA. See, I wouldn't... Yeah. I would want to send up a probe that slows this thing down. And I think it I think it would be sort of a cool solution if we if we docked a big heat shield just to the top of it. Assuming Neon, did you capture it into low curve in orbit? Or were you losing stability from a highly energetic an energetic reentry? Because this craft may re-enter just fine if you slow it down in low curve and orbit in the first place. You know, it may not need anything on it. If you just slow it to a nominal 2300 meter per second low curve and orbit, you slow it down with the tug to re-enter it, you get it down to 2000, it may survive just fine if it's not coming in at a hot interplanetary trajectory. It may not need any changes. It may just need a tug up here that attaches to it and slows it down for the capture, which would be the dual the dual uh, node phasing rendezvous. Never achieve capture. Always lost stability due to high energy. It's okay for low energy entries. So probably the right decision here would be to... I think we drop it in the water as well. Um, the right decision would probably be just to send a rescue tug up and slow the whole thing down. That's a better solution than docking a big shield to the top of it. Because does everybody understand, like, you're picking up what I'm putting down here? Um, I like that because it makes it into a big shuttlecock, basically. But in order to do that, we would have to meet the craft out here and modify it before it tried its directory entry, right? So we could certainly try to do that to meet it while it's still days or hours from Kerbin. Probably hours from Kerbin once it crosses Minmus. 
Um, but that would be a very challenging thing to do, to try and meet it with a rescue craft that docks a part to it here. The simplest thing to do is to meet it down here in low curve and orbit with a tug and attach the tug to it and then use the tug to capture. That approach gives you basically no pan for... That's exactly right, yeah. You love how wily e. Coyote the heat shield option is. <laughs> Slowing it down once you're captured. So the, the safe way, the, the right way to do it would be a tug that basically plays catch and then slows it down into orbit to capture. And in order to do that, we would need to figure out what the... Uh, mass of this craft is right now. Can I see that? I need to go back to the craft. It's 15.83 tons. We would get rid of some of it because we wouldn't need to keep all of this stuff on it, so we could calculate what the mass of all this is. And I think that this is easily, between fuel and engines, this is less than 10 tons. Right? We actually need this craft save file. Like, we do at NASA, it's like, oh, we got the rover that... We got the, the tech demonstrator at JPL that we're going to go ahead and play with while the real craft is in orbit. What you were trying and gave up on was the tug method. Gotcha. No probe. You're running from heliocentric or something like that. Yeah, it's certainly possible to do. Um, but I think if, if I was doing it, there are tourists on board. Because there are tourists on board, I would say we need to go with the safe option that gives us redundancy. And the safe option that gives us redundancy is a tug playing catch. Right? A tug playing catch is the right the right thing to do, I bet you. Acme, the official supplier of the Kerbal Space Program. It all makes sense now. <laughs> You're just not that good at rendezvous. I'll, I'll show you how to do it. Neon, it's so easy to do. Um, I will show you how to do it, right? Craft kitchen. Shift all the vessels in flight into a craft file. I've never seen that before, Loopy. No, that sounds cool. KerbalTech.com, craft kitchen. If you upload a save file, it extracts all the vessels in the flight into a craft file. Cool. I'm, I'm just going to sort of guesstimate this, right? I'm just going to take a screenshot and then we'll put it together at a boilerplate or whatever and, and come up with a worst case scenario because if we end up with more Delta V, that's better. But we could always use this and, and we could use the claw to attach to the tug. If I was doing it, I, I don't want to carry all this mass because then our tug doesn't need all this mass. But I would feel sort of sketched out clawing to the heat shield, right? And then relying on the heat shield to protect us after we've <laughs> grabbed it with a big grabber claw thing. Uh, from a role play perspective, I would probably say, no, let's not attach to the heat shield. <laughs> let's attach to this end of it. <laughs> the claw into the now empty tank. Um, no, I would probably separate all of this stuff. And I would use this claw to attach the tug to it. And maybe as a backup thing. Um, see, from an ultra hardcore perspective, it would also be sketchy to claw to the crew container, right? <laughs> like to grab a hold of the crew container. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to design a robotic arm that sort of grabs it in a cradle and then slows everything down. We could do that with a cargo bay. We could retract all this stuff, and we could actually put it into a cargo bay, and then we could attach it to the inside of the cargo bay with a claw, but in case something went wrong, it would still be encapsulated in a cargo bay. But I don't want to claw onto the orange tank section because I don't want to carry this mass. When I claw onto it, I want to cut the craft in half and get rid of all that mass. And I just want to rescue this part of the craft is what I want to do. That's that's what I was so so nothing south of the decoupler would be would be claw territory because I don't want to claw all this mass right. Um, let's go design a rescue craft. Uh, let's toss this thing together and I took a screenshot so we can look at it. Um, oh, well, I could also do this I guess. Exit. I accidentally just started the engine because I hit. Shift Control S. Now nah, we'll recalculate everything. It's fine. Whatever. <laughs> it's, the fuel leaks out over time, right? The fuel leaks out over time. Claw to the bottom of the service bay. So I didn't want to claw into the heat shield. I didn't want to claw into the heat shield because just from a role play perspective, you shouldn't use a grabber to grab onto the heat shield and then trust the heat shield for reentry, right? Um, thanks again. No, dude, I'm having fun with this. I'm having fun with this. I, I, it's been a very long time. I usually don't load up people's saves, but this is actually really fun. Um, let me grab, I was going to grab paint here so I could see the craft. 
Come on. Okay, yeah. I just I took a quick screenshot so I can look at it. And these nerds are just going to hurdle through space. I used a couple Delta V, but don't tell anybody. It's just natural. It's hydrogen atoms leaking out through the skin of the fuel tanks over time or something. Right. Um, I just need a screenshot to do to prove Dust uses mech jab. No, I don't. I don't use a mech jab. So we want a rescue craft that has a couple different ways that we can rescue this thing. Uh, it looks like this. It has that. It has a claw on the top, which is coupling, I think. Yep, there's a claw on the top. Uh, it has... It looks like that's four parachutes, or three axymmetry on the parachutes. That is right there, right in front of that little thing. It looks like double three axymmetry to me. Cause that, ooh, that puts one right over the hatch. That can't be right. Maybe it's four axymmetry, not three axymmetry. <laughs> I, I, I actually need to go back and look at it. I don't even see the little... It may be 3 symmetry like that. Actually, that looks like the way that it is to keep the hatch clear. That's the thing. Are MechJab jokes still good on here? No jokes. Loopy, just the absolute fact that uh, MechJab makes it harder to learn the game for people that already have a basis of knowledge. Nothing, nothing different. Same exact thing that we have always taught. Um, if you want to learn how to play the game, don't install MechJab. Nothing new. Just the facts, as you do. I, I don't know how many drugs there are, but I'll just put the drugs on there. It's fine, whatever. Uh, I, just, I just need the number of drugs. Um, let's grab this because that is a thing there as well. And then we have the service bay, which is this one, like that. And I got some science experiments and stuff in the service bay. Uh, a couple of these. So let's just grab these things, like that. I saw a battery in there as well. I think battery as well. <laughs> It's hey, neon. It's it's a long it's a long standing joke. Um, a lot of people, over five years and like eight thousand hours of me doing this, seven thousand, six thousand. I don't even know at this point. Um, I get a lot of people who come in and they're like, oh, I can't get MechJeb to dock. Da da da. And I'm like, you know what your first problem is, MechJeb. <laughs> but uh, it's it's just a long running joke. Play the game that you enjoy playing the game. If you come around here, I'm not going to teach you to use MechJab. I'm going to teach you to do it the right way. And then if you want to use MechJab, you can. But uh, it's just a long-running joke where we we sort of say, Oh, gosh, MechJab, ox, it burns. For my help desks, <laughs> at one point I went in and, and I did a help desk. And uh, during my help desk, like the start of the help desk, I just put MechJab on the screen. I was like, all right, ask MechJab your questions. See how good it is at teaching you how to play Kerbal. Go ahead. Just ask away. It's fine. Just do your thing. <laughs> ah, yes. We do the same thing with canards, right? So canards, too many people put canards on the craft because they don't know how to engineer it correctly. And they're just like, well, I don't know, throw some canards on it. That fixed it. And instead of learning the right way to balance the forces on the craft, they just toss some canards on because canards are like easy mode. You just toss canards on, right? So I am also against canards. I, I don't teach canards unless we set out to design a craft that has canards in the first place. But I never solve a craft just by throwing canards on it because it's like, it's the easy way out. It's the same thing with the, the, the rapier engines. We don't like the rapier engines because rapier engines are easy mode. Um, so we try to learn other ways to design things. But too many people are like, oh my gosh, I hate DOS. He always says this, he always says that. At the end of the day, you play the game the way that you have fun playing it, and, and you learn the game the way that you enjoy learning it. And I have a way that I teach, and other people have ways that they want to do it, and it's all good. Um, it is all good. So there are also these little solar panales on here. And Are they the retractable ones? I can't actually see, but we'll just put the heavier ones on, because if we overestimate, that's better than underestimating, right? We'll put those on. And I believe this is the basic craft. So we're looking at 7.980 tons. Uh, probably a little bit more than that because of the scanning arm and stuff you had. Wherever that scanning arm was. 60 kilograms. That's not the end of the world. You know? So we're looking at 8 tons, but we can we can go for 10 tons. Right? And I want to I wanna design for more than we actually think we need. So this is 8.1 tons now. That's not bad. 
Let's drive it up to 10 tons and then design a craft that has 2,500 Delta V for 10 tons. I'm just going to grab something that weighs like 2 tons. 2.25 tons. Because it's good. If, if we build something that is more than we need, that is not a bad thing. That puts me at 10.35 tons. And I'm literally just going to put this box of rocks in here. Let's, uh, let's close this down. Because I don't want to accidentally use those, right? But that's full wet, right? And I'm just going to leave that there so I can uh, bring it out when I don't need it anymore. And we want to rescue this puppy. So it looks like it's going to fit in four units of Mark III cargo. Uh, do we have... Oh, we don't have the Mark III cargo bay unlocked. Aha! So we can't use the Mark III cargo bay. We can't use the Mark III cargo bay. I was... I was going to design something that looked like this. Mark III cargo bay... Nose, like that, nose cone, telemetry, that sort of stuff. Engine pods on the side of it, like that. And we would fly, and then we'd have probably another type of engine here or something. I, it may just be look like a lick -a stick. I don't know. And uh, then go up there and open up the cargo bay and eat the other craft and close the cargo bay and then capture it, <laughs> right? We don't, ah, shucks, we don't have to do that, I guess. I was looking forward to using the Car Mark III cargo bays. So, all right, so we're going to need to build a moon base to get enough science to unlock the Mark III cargo base. <laughs> How much science do you have? How much on the ship to be rescued that could be transmitted? Um, I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. It's I think you only had a little bit of science, so let's just go with what you have. Let's go with what you have, right? So we need to know how much... We can't actually attach anything to that. We need to know how much Delta V we have, so let's just make a little fake thing here and I just I just need an attachment point right and we're gonna point that sucker straight up and I'm just gonna put a maneuver node up here like that let's open this arm and then grab this and I'm just I'm just putting a fake node that I can attach things to right there right good enough so how much fuel do we need in order to slow this puppy down just yeah because no. <laughs> we do have to get this to orbit remember so if we do that, and we do our own poodle, which is probably the best engine we've got here. What is the 361 vacuum ISP, 334 sea level ISP? 3,000 thrust? <laughs> Good night, Irene. It doesn't look like the inflatable heat shield is uh, unlocked either right now. So you'd have to, you'd have to do your own. Like, roll your own heat shield buckyball, right? <laughs> if you wanted to do that. you don't. It doesn't look like the inflatable one is unlocked. We do have a 3.75 meter heat shield. But we could, all day, every day, just make our own massive heat shield like that. Dude, that actually looks really legit. <laughs> huh. I mean... I'm not even mad. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> How much does that weigh? Weighs a couple tons. Weighs a little bit. It's fine. <laughs> Those are like 1.65 tons each. They probably don't even need all their uh, ablator, right? And if I grab this poodle engine. See, in Ultra Hardcore Career, we'd even have to design for what if this engine fails. And we would have to have redundant engines that could still perform the capture in the event of an engine failure would be something that we are required to design towards. But that, is that correct? That says 669, but that's not gonna be in vacuum mode. I need to switch to vacuum mode. Folks, that one tank with the engine on it is rocking 2603 Delta V. You could almost, if, if there was a, if you were okay pumping fuel with a claw, you could literally just send a fuel tank up and refuel the tanks that are already on that thing. And it would probably be enough Delta V to actually capture. You know? But that's literally all you need. Right there. And probe core, RCS, da 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 it would, it would bring it down some, so we would probably take even more. Uh, but that right there... Yeah, the only fuel we're using is in that tank. And that's 2603 Vacuum Delta V rocking the uh, Poodle engine. That's exactly what you were trying to do. Gotcha. Yushi Trafalgar. I don't know. I'm not done with it. I just got to figure out when we're going to do it, you know? 
What if you use the breaking ground to make a fuel umbilical for lower fuel transfer that folds out of the tug? We'd still have to claw to it, you know? And there's no docking ports anywhere down on the, the bottom of the stage. This is, the right thing to do is probably this right here. I mean, a craft this size, I don't have any qualms flying a craft this size. You could play around with it if, if you wanted to mess with it, right? You could do all sorts of different designs. You could do something like that. And then you could you could grab these, right? You could put those on there like that. And, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that you could do if you wanted to. Um, try to make something that's like, oh, yes, we are here to rescue you. And then make it look pretty. Uh, I don't know that I would want to really over-design this. Who, d Who doesn't unlock the bendy nose cone? Where's my fashionable bendy nose cone? Jeez. <laughs> but there's there's all sorts of stuff you could do, but the right solution here is probably KISS, to keep it simple. And I would not have any qualms about that. And that. And then just make this into a fully capable tug, right? Because we, we know that we can get this into orbit. Um, let's build it this way. And to grab these fuel tanks. Like that. Oh, come on. There we go. Like that. And then we have... That's 3265 Delta V. And we could completely expend these fuel tanks. And I'm doing some math here. We'd still have 2480 Delta V if we completely expend those fuel tanks. And if we say that we can only use that, we reroute so that that's the root node. Take that off. That's 1119 Delta V. So that's not... We do need a lot more Delta V to actually catch up to it. This was early in career mode to try and stuff in 1.9. You went to Jewel? <laughs> you went to Jewel is your early in new career mode? <laughs> I'm giving you a hard time, Neon. <laughs> You've got to pursue and match velocity. That's the big that's the big trick here. Getting that amount of fuel to pursue and match velocity is the big trick. What are those 360? Yeah, those are 360 each. So we would probably switch this out a little bit. And at this point, we, we I think we've sort of solved what we need to do. At this point, it's going to become Fashion Academy. <laughs> you know how it goes. But uh, let's grab these will work. And then this is payload. That's almost 2,000 Delta V. But that's not enough still, right? We need to have... I mean, we need to have the capture delta V. We need to have 2,000, more than 2,000 delta V. So does this begin looking like this? Let's find out. Um, might as well just slap a probe core on here real quick. Oh, the flat probe core. We don't have the flat probe core yet. That's okay. I better build it the right way too. So make that the route. Can I put a bigger fuel tank on it? That's not a bigger fuel tank. I mean, you got these big fuel tanks unlocked. Just for giggles, how much Delta V does that have? 6,000 Delta V. <laughs> but I really want to separate out the missions, right? I want to separate out the missions. So we'd probably use multiple of those big fuel tanks. Let's look at this. It's just a huge fuel tank we're going to launch. That's that. Is that the skinniest fuel tank? That one's got 1350. That one's got 1620. Okay, so you do have this one unlocked. All right, look, it's good. like a potato, a potato tug. Build a big fuel tank because that Raptor engine is thirsty. Nice. You're on Discord that does realistic mission control. I've seen that. No, I've seen that before. You ace. I've, I've seen people that do that. That's not really my jam, um, but I've seen I've absolutely seen people that do that sort of stuff. That's really cool. Oh man, all of that looks cool. That, that all looks good. So if we lock down this fuel tank, that's 2644 delta V. And then these are empty. And then you unlock this. That's 4,000 Delta V, but then you put your target 10 tons on it. 
and that's 2360 delta v that's really close that's really close to what we need i sort of like the potato tug <laughs> design <laughs> I, I, th I think we may need to go with the potato tug design <laughs> just because I mean we could fashion it and stuff we could do all sorts of stuff with it but it seems like the potato tug design would be enough to accomplish the mission let's work through the math we need to get to, or to orbit getting to orbit doesn't cost us that much we need to phase our orbits to get the rendezvous done. We know that it's 2,000 to capture, so we basically need to have double 2,000 because we're gonna have to catch up to it and then we're gonna have to slow down again. New question, why would you need to pursue? Why would you need to pursue? Could you just match orbit and allow the target ship to catch up to the tug? You could, so so Apulu Felgar, um, that is a great question. Here's sort of the scenario we're working with here, right? Let's look outside so we can draw. Um, we have Kerbin. And we have this craft that's coming by at a very high velocity. And if the velocity there was 2,000, um, 2,200, and it cost us 2,400 or something like that to actually circularize, right? That means that our orbital velocity right here is going to be almost 5,000 meters per second, right? So this craft is coming in really quickly. And if I put something Welcome back to the Academy. in another orbit like that, and I make that o other orbit exactly match up so that they end up right there, the velocity of this craft is going to be about 2,200. And the velocity of the incoming craft is going to be almost 5,000. So these things would end up going thof, by each other at kilometers per second, right? So what we need to do is we need to set up this other craft so that it's on an orbit that looks like that. So it has a higher speed when it comes down here. And then when it gets here, it's gonna haul the mail to catch up with that craft. And it's gonna have to burn a thousand, two thousand delta V. The differential between its orbital velocity here and the orbital velocity of the target incoming. So it's not about just putting up a catcher's mitt and having something slam into it at three kilometers a second. Um, it's about getting something in position with enough energy so that this craft can actually burn and escape and match, attach, and then slow the entire conglomeration down in inner orbit. And it's actually going to be a little bit less efficient because of what we're trying to do there, right? Does that does that sort of clear it up in terms of what we what we have to do? Yeah, or kaboom. Hedge zero. I appreciate you, Hedge Zero. Thank you very much for the 63 months. 63 months. So we're gonna burn kind of a lot one way and then undo all that just to get to zero. Uh, kind of, not really. We're going to end up in an orbit. It looks like an egg, I know. And then we're going to burn to increase the energy of our orbit so that the apoapsis increases such that our velocity increases down here. And so normally you'd be in a... I'm just making these numbers up for nice round numbers. Normally if you were circular, you'd be 2,000 meters per second. And if we burn into this circular, this elliptical orbit, we would end up with the velocity down here of... It's not going to be much. It's only going to be like 2,500 or something like that, right? Because escape is 800, 900. Um, but what we want to do is we want to make it so that our differential between the incoming vessel and what this craft is after it skates down from the apoapsis, after it rolls downhill in its orbit, we want that differential to be smaller so that we're not having to try and catch up by 2.5 meters per second, or 2.5 kilometers per second, right? <clears throat> this is why I like this, because this is a really interesting interesting problem to solve. Um so that hopefully that got you got you what you were looking for i'd feel better if we had more fuel i always feel better if we have more fuel um we are sort of playing fast and loose with the numbers if those tanks let me run through it one more time and just make sure that i feel okay about it so this is it trying to get matched up and it needs to already be in the 2000 meter per second orbit Roughly, it should be less if we're... Oh, no, it should be 2,200, actually. So we're assuming that we can deliver this payload untouched, none, none of the fuel out of this used, to low carbon orbit. Uh, well, it was like 120 or something like that, right? Use last of the vehicle's fuel, those 300 meters per second, to slow it down on SOI entry. We could, Loopy. Uh, we could, as long as we still have the rendezvous. 
So the amount of time that's going to be, we re-enter, how much time before we pass Kerbin, and then does that give us enough time to phase a rendezvous? I almost don't want to do that because I want to, well in advance, have the rescue ship in place on a phased orbit that's going to meet the other one. So if you change your incoming trajectory after you enter the SOI, that could be a deal, right? And we could. Oh, yeah, we could use a different stage to catch up that we could stage in Cirque Lysis. <laughs> Patugo, the pierogi, the tato tug, <laughs> the tug tato. <laughs> I like it. Um, just from a safety perspective, since I, and I'm role-playing this a little bit, since it's tourists whose lives are on the line, if this tug does not catch them, I don't want to be messing with things, right? I, I really don't want to be messing with things there. So let me run, let me run through the numbers again. Um, we could even practice this. Assuming we deliver this to 120, 130, whatever the number was, kilometer orbit, uh, our orbital velocity up there should be somewhere around, I'm just going to use a number that's too high, 22, right? 2200. And if we needed, it was like 1400 to basically capture, but more than 2000 to completely capture, it was 2200 to completely capture. This tug is going to need to accelerate all of its fuel. It'd be nice if it was 2400. And then it's going to have to accelerate itself plus 10 tons, another 2400. I'm literally just going to go with those numbers. And we really, since Kerbal doesn't show me what the approach velocity is going to be, that may be a problem. Like, Kerbal doesn't tell me what my velocity at periaps is going to be, so we're trying to back our way into that by looking at what the capture velocity is going to be. I hope my math isn't incorrect on this, or, or the way that we're thinking it isn't incorrect, but I need 2,400 delta V full of fuel, then I need 2,400 remaining delta V with an extra 10 tons on board, right? So we're in orbit, it's time for us to start going. And yeah, we would be bringing the target vehicle to LKO, that is the plan, yeah. You enjoy the roleplay aspect, you don't kill Kerbals, but that's about it. Yeah, I, it's, it gives you more things to think about, because it's crazy when you roleplay this things, you run into so many situations and sorts of scenarios that you would have to think about for a real space mission. You know? You have all sorts of fun rules for your own save, it's a space planes based career, lots of modular assembly, rules about crew transfer. This week you're doing crew safety studies for a new space plane. Nice, Loopy! It, it really is. It's like the game is the canvas and you come up with these wacky rules or whatever and it's like, no, we can't do that because I say so. It's my rules. Um, that's the same thing about like our, our insanity and stuff where the Kerbals have to have X amount of room or they'll go insane and stop working in ultra hardcore career. So it's not just you slam them in a little pod and send them wherever. You have to design a mothership for them to ride in and be comfortable the entire time. Um, <clears throat> okay, working the math. Let's run the numbers here. So without this, we have 2,600 delta V without this. And that should be enough for us to catch up with the spacecraft. That tank is fully fueled. That tank is fully fueled. This tank is locked down. And we're reporting 2,664 delta V with that tank completely locked down. We use that fuel up. Right? We spend all of that fuel getting this thing to rendezvous with the target. And that's assuming we're already in a 2200 kilometer orbit and we spend another 2600 matching it. Because the capture is well under that. Then we unlock this. That's 4000 delta V for just this craft, but if we put the target clawed onto it, that becomes 2360 delta V which is about right. You're going to need a tiny bit of extra weight for solar antennas. That's true. That's, that might throw off the numbers a little bit. But we'll do the same sort of exercise for those. And that's using this fuel to slow down that tug, or to slow down this craft, and we've got 2360 delta V there. So we know that the minimum capture delta V to sort of get them safely in Kerbin orbit was like 15 or 1600. Somebody should have written these numbers down. <laughs> um... So we know that if we're rocking 2360, we should be able to slow it down. It would be nice if we had some overage. Like if we just had bonus fuel, I would feel better about it if we had bonus fuel. So what if we did this? I'm just, I'm just collating data here. That's 3485 Delta V. 
but we're going to have a lot less Delta V in just these tanks, but it doesn't matter because we have more fuel overall. We're just sort of calculating these things. See, that's only 1,400 Delta V. With that tank completely locked. And it's a little bit harder to do the math if you have the tanks. You almost need three tanks in there, right? Hmm. I think you're going to need a chalkboard and some erasers. We should play Alex. <laughs> I would feel comfortable with this, right? Because we know that adding fuel, we're going to end up with more energy overall. So whether we're rocking the 10 tons or not, we know that if we add fuel, we'll end up with more Delta V. So even if we did that, and then did, I guess we could do the differential in Delta V. Even if we used half of that tank, that's still 2167, and we wouldn't use half of that tank. That's 3,000 Delta V if we have to dip into this tank to do the rendezvous. <laughs> no, no, no. There's just the meme thing. Neon, it's just the meme thing where you see all the, the memes of people using the, the, the dry erase markers. That you, those are like all over the internet. No spoilers, no story, no nothing. No, I don't do that sort of stuff. But all I've seen is the people all over the internet with the dry erase marker things. If... Hopefully that's not a spoiler. I don't think it's a spoiler. There was a math teacher that was doing math class in Alex, like writing equations in the game. That should be a spoiler. Um, I think I'm comfortable with this, right? It's Is that in the first 10 seconds of the game? See, I don't even know that. That's in the first 10 seconds of the game. Nice. I think that this potato or whatever we end up calling it, is fine. It weighs 46 tons. We build a lifter to get this into orbit and call it a day. Uh, we, need to, we need to march forward with this so that we actually accomplish something, right? So designing a tug. We shouldn't claw a claw to a claw. Are y'all comfortable relying on the target craft's claw for the connection? Are you comfortable with that? Y'all can answer. Are you comfortable with that? That's way too much Delta V. Or sorry, that's way too much Monoprov. Not Delta V. Yeah, but you don't play ultra hard. You were doing claw to claw? <gasps> you think that's fine? The claw is there for a reason. I'm curious as to why the claw is there. Like, what, why was the claw in that craft in the first place? Is, is a question that I am burning to understand. <laughs> it's very curious that a tourism vessel would have a claw on it. Um, for, for my book. For, for my my... Yeah, I was just say my book. That's a super curious decision to make. <laughs> and I'm just I'm cleaning something up up here. Get that in the middle of that line. Like that. Make it so the bottom thing looks like it's connected. There's a little bit of quantum fuel storage there, but it's not very much. Would verniers be better? We could just slap some Veer Governors on there, I guess. <sighs> But then you end up using that. What's the ISP? Uh, what's the ISP is a good question here. D well, are they unlocked? They are unlocked. 260? 240? It's more efficient to use that. Blah! Yeah, the Veer Governors would be better. I wanted to make it look cool, though. Whatever. We should actually put some extra fuel in it for this. Uh, maybe, like, little fuel tanks here around the outsides, right? I may drop some frames here, y'all, if something's downloading or something. Stand by. You don't remember exactly why Claw, but probably in case of need for a rendezvous for more fuel given this tra crazy trajectory. Nice. We can do this. We're still dropping frames. We're not completely dropping frames, but we are dropping some frames there. These Veer Governors aren't going to give you roll control either, so you're going to have to rely on reaction wheels.
I'm doing it my way. <laughs> I want to do it this way, okay? I just, just, <laughs> I just want to do it this way. <laughs> Please, can I do it this way? It looks cooler. Neon, are you okay with me doing it this way? <laughs> just using regular, regular monoprop. <laughs> Even if it's not really the best way to do it. Yes, look how fashionable that is. See? Look at all the fashion. And we're literally going to put that on these. Yes. That looks like such a legitimate strategy. <laughs> Maybe put a service bay for the reaction wheel plus core plus battery. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. We will do all of these things. Do not do not fret. I've built a couple craft in my time. All right, so there's that. We have the one at the top. We have the one at the bottom. It's very fashionable looking. Um, I like it. I don't know. We need to have. We don't want to have a cloud of the probe core here. What? Uh, what is a surface that would feel comfortable it clawing to? Like a like a, like a plate, like a girder or something. Honestly, any of these Rockomax brand adapters would probably be a legitimate claw target. You know. We root it so that that's our root node. Take the probe core off. Like, that's probably a legitimate target. And then that's a target with... Okay, so now we're going to need to design one of the little docking probe things, like on the ISS, so we know if we're lined up. <laughs> You're fine with monoprop? <laughs> you do you. <laughs> All right, so let's grab... Uh, and I keep forgetting that we're maybe a little bit limited here. Let's grab this. Put that on there. Oh, we have that unlocked. We have a fly-by-wire avionics sud. That's good. Because then we can take one of our uh, probe cores. Do we have anything that's more advanced than these? We don't have the advanced probe cores. That one's just SAS. That one's prograde retrograde hold, which is slightly better. Put that like that. And uh, if we add this in, I guess it doesn't matter because we were adding this in. We have like our little command and control thing. Next, we're going to be putting fuel cells on it. Not really. Oh, look, it, it matches. We can have the lines, the black lines match. <laughs> There's an actual crew member on board. No probe core plus two or some board. No, there were, there were three crew members on board, Shady Walker. There were three crew members on board. There were three crew members on board. Just go ahead. Put a light. An approach light. Like that. Bring it down as, as an approach light sort of thing, right? Look at this. It's going all 2001. Um, we could actually also have a, a, a acquisition light. So this is a longer range light. Now I'm just making stuff up. That looks flat enough. I'm okay with it, though. That looks good. Um, we have the probe core on there. We're going to need batteries, electric charge, da -da -da -da, that sort of stuff. We could, Well, let's see the center of mass. Center mass is near the front, but we want to put our we want to put some stuff near the front of it to balance out the mass of the engines, right? So that regardless of how much fuel we use, we're still balanced. So I'm gonna do the same thing down here, and we can actually use a bigger one. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Some light clipping is allowed in some cases. I don't know if I like that or not. I'm not in love with it. I'll put it on the sides. I don't know, because I was trying to balance it out. I was going to put batteries into... I could put a reaction wheel on there. I don't think that's too clipped. But then we could put the light in the middle of that as well, actually. It's a legitimate strategy. Um, probably don't even just use the small reaction wheel, too. Anybody have any opinions on this? There's a million ways to build this. What's in the little nub? Nose cone probe core and... Uh, so this, it's just the probe core, and then it's an avionics hub that makes that probe core more capable. So if you add the avionics hub to a probe core, um, it makes it... It gives it all of the different uh, command authority things. Stability assist, prograde retro, maneuver target tracking, da da da, -da. Like it, it has a lot of different things on it. See? That's what that's for. It's just... It, it, up, it basically upgrades the probe core, right? <clears throat> How well do the off-center reaction wheels work? Oh, it's fine, CFT. It's, the off-center reaction wheels will be fine. 
I mean, if you really wanted to do something about it, this is a little clippy for my taste, but you could fashion it like this. Right? And you could tuck reaction wheels underneath that like that. That's a little too clippy for my taste. No, it's not. I like it. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> Whatever. Center mass is still a little bit further back. Yeah, and it's going to be way towards the back when we're empty of fuel. Yeah, it's fine. Nothing's wrong. Saber, what are you raiding my channel for? Huh? Jeez. Y'all, somebody put a heart in chat for Saber over there. Um, it's just not nearly enough mass near the front to do anything. Is it an upper stage? It's actually a rescue tug. So this thing is supposed to be a rescue tug to rescue something. That probe core may mess up your nav ball. Is that a setting that can be changed? Change the rocket nav ball to flying in airplane mode of nav. Not sure if you get me airplane mode of nav. What is airplane mode of nav? There's there's surface, orbit, and target. Surface is typically in atmosphere. Um, orbit is typically out of atmosphere, and then target is when you're, you're approaching a target. But Babacito, um, like literally, explain a little bit what you're talking about, and I'll see if I can I can get to the bottom of it. Um. Electric generation, batteries, we need those things. So let's go grab some power generation. For this design, you don't even really need this. That's way more electric charge than you're going to need. It looks nice, though. Honestly, I should be asking Neon if they think it looks nice. Like, if you like it. <laughs> Maybe he's gotten into docking mode or something? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I would actually put like an auxiliary docking port or something on it just so that we could, if we needed to, dock to it. We could claw to the docking port, couldn't we? <gasps> the large docking port isn't unlocked yet. Interesting. That's curious. What do we have doing the Kirby 1X craft orbiting Kirby? That's what we're working on right now. That's what we're working on right now. Hey, Fuzzy the Killer, how are you doing? Um. Electric charge was the thing that we're missing. We don't have a lot of electric charge on this thing right now. But we can honestly just put batteries on it. We don't need to overthink it. And two batteries, four batteries would be fine. In fact, I would let's just put two batteries in the line here. Like we've upgraded a single battery. <laughs> I like it. You love how it looks. You don't design ships like this at all, but it looks great. Oh, nice. Excellent, excellent, excellent. I, it's, my sort of thing is I've done everything in Kerbal numerous times. Like, I've done so many things in Kerbal. And so the the thing that really sort of gets my, that makes me happy is, is making craft that are both functional but also look cool, right? So I want to make something that looks like a tug or something as opposed to just, meh, toss it together. I would even give it a belly button. <laughs> Like, bing, bang, boom, right on the center of mass, I would give it a belly button so that we could use that to actually uh, refuel. Or you could, This could also be a design for a fueling station. I mean, heck, we, we could, if we had the larger docking ports, we could make it so you could attach three of these things together and go full-on Von Braun STS mode. Oh, my. I love that. It's one of my first careers. I... I built the Von Braun style space transport system not the just the shuttle which was like a little teeny tiny glimmer of what the STS was supposed to be um, it wasn't supposed to be the the low orbit school bus system it was supposed to be the space transport system have you ever seen that like the uh, oh my gosh if people haven't seen this I, I always have to show this off uh, but it's it's a system that uses tugs to kick things out to interplanetary trajectories and uh, let me see here if I can find it real quick. No, I did not mean that. I'm trying to find the... Yes. Is this right? Some of it's in here. That's a bunch of new stuff, but where's the uh, where's the old stuff? It was the Argosy. We'll search for Argosy. 
I gotta show this off because it's really cool. Or go see Planet Fall. Nope, that's not it. Oh, come on. There's so much cool art in this. I'm not finding the right thing. I don't even know where to find it anymore. That's sad. Um, does anybody know the Drill 7, the DeviantArt thing? What I was looking for? Not sure if it's a glitch. I was designing a rocket and placed that probe cone. The thing is, it changed the probe grade to the horizon. Ah, ah. Right click and control from here is what you need. So if you get a probe core, the rocket's sitting on the pad, and it's the nav wall is, is pointing towards the horizon, it means that your control from here is incorrect. And you just need to right click on a docking port or a probe core that's pointed up along the main axis of the rocket and tell it to control from there. Is that it? Yeah, I'll show you when we get outside. I can, I can show you a demonstration of it real quick. Yes! Oh, this. This right here is one of the first things. I've built all this in Kerbal. Um, this is an artist's concept of the original space transport system. The way that Von Braun had nuclear tugs sort of designed. And uh, these tugs, right? These are three tugs that you can attach together onto the payload. And this is the artist concept. This is supposed to be preparing for a kick to Mars. And it's amazing. Are there any other? Oh my gosh. There's another view from the back with the nuclear engines. Where's the one where it's actually peeling off though? That's the throne. Can I go back and forth and try to find? That's capturing at Mars. That's deploying a payload. That's a larger ship. Okay, that's into other things. Oh, I'm just about to draw it for you. It's just all sorts of cool space art. All right, I'll draw it, whatever. Um, so this design, the original STS design, was supposed to have these tugs. There's the space shuttle back in the background, right? It's some lifting body, and there's a, there's a space station. But these tugs were actually supposed to be attached together. So you design one tug, right, like this, and you would put a payload on the top of that tug, like that, and that tug would have a Nerva engine on the back of it, and in order to kick this thing out of the solar system, or not out of the solar system, out of Earth orbit, and send it on its way to Mars, you would attach two other tugs to the side of it. Exact same tug design, exact same Nerva engine on the back of them, right? Everything's exactly the same, but they're designed to be attached together to make a system. And these two outer ones would do the ejection burn to transfer it, to get it going on its way to Mars. And then before the end of the burn, they were supposed to separate and literally fly back to Earth, recircularize down low, get refueled, and connect up to the next payload to send on its way. It's like the original reusable space transport system designs. This wasn't like, oh, send it to Earth once and just get it into orbit and then uh, do it one time. This was putting architecture in orbit to just create a highway between the Earth and Mars. And then the center stage would keep on going on the way to Mars, flip it around backwards and capture it Mars, and then it wouldn't need as much payload. It could bring things back. It could refuel out there, all that sort of stuff. Oh, my gosh, it's so cool. And you could do all this in Kerbal. Um, oh. Anyways. <laughs> Though, sadly, it flew the wrong way. You're there for 125. Oh, you were, talking about, uh, you were talking about the shuttle there. Twitch machine, thank you again for finding that stuff. And yeah, you did. MRC gifted a 50 subs yesterday. 50 subs. Warhammer, you got one of them. So uh, I will tell MRC1080 thank you if uh, they show up today. Anyways. All right. Anyways. All right. All right. <laughs> I want my tugs to connect together, and then I want to make it so that, oh, we're going to... Because all of a sudden you use this design to send all your ships everywhere, right? But I digress. <laughs> this is the drive section for everything. I wish I were, we were in the timeline where that happened. Nice. <laughs> oh, chat, what am I missing? Uh, gut check on this. I have fuel. We did the math. We think that this is plenty of fuel to at least, at least cap to rendezvous and capture. Um, I've done power generation. I've got power storage. I've got command and control plus an upgrade. I've got monoprop. I've got attitude control. The reaction wheels are a little overdone, but, you know, whatever. They look cool. Um, we have a target for this to attach to. And for this one, we're not going to worry about putting docking ports on and stuff like that, right? The save we had with Aces was legit. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. When Tori hung out with us and we talked about aces and we put we were putting together all the aces design stuff in Kerbal and Zeus and everything, that was cool. Um Generation, attitude control, fuel. We should probably double check the Delta V again. So let's look at the Delta V. Because I did add some monoprop to it that's going to change things a bit. That's 6453 Delta V. And if we need to spend 2400 Delta V, let's get this down to 4000. Take out that fuel as if it was burning. Take out that fuel as if it was burning. And take out this fuel until we have 4000 remaining. So that's 3906, right? So this would be potentially the amount of fuel we would have remaining. And if we slap 10 tons on this puppy, how's it looking? 2601 after that. So 24 to circular to, to, to match the other target's trajectory. And then once we attach to it, we've got another 2601 to uh, bring that puppy back home, most of the way at least, right? Um, wow, my original career, I don't even know if that's around anymore. It may be on YouTube, but I don't have it handy. Jeep Freak. Antennas. Yes, antennas. Good call. Let's put some antennas on it. Um, what do we have unlocked for antennas? Yeah, we've got... Slap a relay antenna on it. Those are ugly. <laughs> it's like, and now, ten minutes deciding which antenna to use. <laughs> Here, look. The light actually increases the antenna. I'm okay with it. Sometimes we like to do the one forward, one backwards antenna design with these high gain antennas. Right? So you got one pointed that way. You got one pointed the other way. And then when you deploy them, you have sort of the talk ahead and talk behind. But those antennas actually look really small. Maybe we put them up here. Let's let's see what they look like if we put them up here. Oh, it's like a it's like a mustache. I think I'm okay with it. Oh yeah. Oops. I don't want them to do that. <laughs> why why you have to why you have to symmetry this way? That's weird. There you go. Two antennas and it can be like oh whenever it captures the craft. <laughs> That should be fine. I don't think they're going to get in the way of anything. Yeah, that's fine. Looks cool, too. And, and really, that's the most important thing. Um, so let's fill it up and slap this thing into orbit real quick. Y'all want to? We'll, we'll hop into basic lifter design for larger payloads. So we could save this as a subassembly real quick. And just call it our rescue target like that and we want to put this in a lifter that's just gonna beat this thing into orbit and that should be pretty straightforward those are five meter parts so we'll stick with five meters we'll put a big old fairing on the top of it let's grab a decoupler we have a nice decoupler 2.5 decoupler i'm okay with it that's ugly remove the shroud um and then we'll grab honestly just a big fairing base oh do we have a fairing big enough for this <laughs> we don't have any fairings. <laughs> the bigger fairings aren't unlocked. <laughs> we have a 1.875 meter fairing. <laughs> oh, help. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> we just... You know what happens when you make an assumption, chat. <laughs> Oh, wow. All right, let's see what we can do. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no, it doesn't get big enough. <laughs> we have to suck the RCS ports in a little bit. <laughs> it doesn't fit. Oh, oh, that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Oh, my gosh. Let's just pop these in. One tick, two ticks, red tick, blue tick, whatever. Um, we'll bring this thing down a little bit like that. All right, that should be good. Same thing here. One ticks, two ticks. Ugh, 
Gag! Barf! I cry every time. That's it. I'm making it a sloth. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Uh, let me go ahead and put these together real quick. It's just gonna... It's just gonna look like a sloth. And everybody's just gonna have to deal with it. Like Sid from Ice Age. Watch. I should have little pieces in there, right? Yeah, sure. I do. And, uh, we're gonna do this. Bring it up. Not bad, actually. Maybe a, maybe a hammerhead shark instead of a sloth. And let's use the smaller reaction wheels. Like that. In 2x symmetry, please. There you go. I mean, I don't know, chat. Y'all want it to go forwards? Like this? It's like a like a narwhal sloth with a really scraggly beard. That does not look like a beard. Those are like little hugging hands, like T-Rex T Rex hands. Um That doesn't that doesn't look terrible with the reaction wheels on the front. <laughs> Alternatively I could turn them sideways and I could tuck it in. Like that. That's probably what we go with right there. Now it looks like a like a hedgehog or a badger or something, right? Um, now <laughs> this is the sketchiest thing uh, ever, basically, <laughs> but it fits. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> what sort of design is this this is hideous um clamshell deploy maximum ejection force I'm, i mean i'm gonna roll with it let's see what it does huh D what are the chances we can put a <laughs> Do I have an engine, like, a, put a bobcat on the bottom of that sucker? That's only 831 delta V. <laughs> What's the thrust of weight on that? 0.36. Yikes. Um, a skipper would probably be better. I was thinking sort of a Soyuz. <laughs> This is actually the new COVID-19 COVID test kit. Um, this is the swab that they use to uh, swab the back of your nasal, like they sort of rub the front part of your brain. Jeez. Uh, is a skipper, what's the skipper, Rockin? 28320, 29310. Dare, dare we do that? <laughs> That's enough Delta V to make it to McDonald's and back. Start with 3.75 tanks, but I don't have... Do we have an adapter? That's sketchy. On a scale of one to probably not legitimate. That's one, one, two, four, Delta V. <laughs> I'm going to put boosters on it, CFT. I'm going to put boosters on it. And the skipper is rocking a 0.52 thrust to weight. Not great, honestly. <sighs> not great with the thrust to weight on the skipper. Tell me you have the mainsail. No. Oh. oh, we don't use the mainsail anyways because it's ugly. Um, <laughs> would look as bad with a proper, yeah, with a proper fairing base. I know. Sketchy is our thing. I resemble that remark. Um, cluster of thuds would look nice. A cluster of thuds, but a skipper's rocking 650, and a thud is 305 vac versus 320. Those are putting out 100 each, so you'd have to run six of those. Mass on six would be six tons versus three tons, so not particularly affected. We could use them as augment thrust, but I don't know that I'm using them, I'd use them as primary thrust. Those are 250 a pop. I think we, if we have to do it a couple times, we can. That's fine. This is just like our kick stage. It's fine. What? Let's put boosters on it and call it a day. Don't overthink it. Um... 
And look, these, these black things are just right for boosters, especially when you still want to slap four of them on. And uh, what if we just put more of these? This will work, right? Oh my gosh. This is not legitimate. But, oh, you can almost make a match. Nice. <laughs> a cluster of bobcats. We could, do a, we could do a cluster of bobcats at the bottom. Bobcats have a high drag, though. So not ideal. I don't want to use the SpaceX engine. Do we just go with all skippers? I just want to. I just want to see. I just want to see. Do I have to wait on the pad for all skippers? Nothing, because we're decoupling them first. Oops, that's not right. There we go. Do I have to wait on the pad for five skippers? 0.93, uh, and that's not even in atmospheric mode. 0.82. So you need more than skippers. Do we have any of these parts? A stack tricoupler. <laughs> we can put the stack tricoupler down there. Uh, but three swivels wouldn't work, and we don't have anything besides the tricouplers. We could pretend that these are the little uh, the little Soyuz verniers, right? We could pretend that this was the case. Oh, that's sketchy. It's beautifully sketchy. What's our thrust to weight in that stage now? 0.96, did it really? 0.82 to 0.96. So that's not very much. It's almost like we need to put more engines on it. Here's the, the compact skipper model and cluster them. We don't really have anything to cluster them appropriately. We have thumpers. That's a thing. We don't have we don't have the bicouplers or anything. The only thing that's unlocked is the tricoupler. We could always do this. Uh, we like to roll our own sometimes. So you do that, and then you come over here like this, and grab one of these, put it on the central core, bring the whole thing up, and I could certainly do this. Right, two x symmetry. Get them pointing the right way. Get them like that. Maybe absolute. And then slap a skipper on that puppy. Let's see how that looks. Let's see. Oh, it's like Bobcat Plus. That actually looks pretty cool. <laughs> so the double skippers is the boosters. Let's see... Let's see what that does in terms of... Oh! That looks properly Kerbal, folks. <laughs> hey, Pro Racer, how you doing? That right there, with a 1.56 thrust to weight, looks properly Kerbal. I think the problem is that that's not enough to make orbit. Because we got 1751, and then we got 1124. That's not going to get us to 3000. We need 3500. So we would need more delta V on this. We are. We do have a really inefficient kick stage. Let's put some more. Let's put some more fuel on it. That ain't right. Please auto strut this. No auto struts. We learn to do things correctly around here. We're not going to auto strut it. No, 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 no. Oh, oh that's wrong. Oops. I need a skinnier nose cone. What does that go down to? 1.8? Oh, man! Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing right there. That's what we're doing. I think that's okay. <laughs> What's our delta V? Now, now that's 2,000 in the first stage and 11.24 in the second stage, so the second stage is a little light. Thrust to weight, 1.63 in vacuum. 1.43, but I could I could make do with a 1.43 pad thrust away. It. it looks proper proper Russian. I wish I wish that these lines sort of matched a little better. Like if we had the 2.5 meter fairing base and we could have that fairing sort of follow that line, you know. I mean, <laughs> this booster design is legit. <laughs> I like it. I am a huge fan of it. Honestly, just more. We can make it a flyback boot. No, I'm kidding. We're not going to make it a flyback booster. Isn't wings that fold out and then it lands on the runway horizontally? 
<laughs> we can catch it in the back of a C-130 or something? I don't know. Um, we need more Central Core Delta V. And I'm a little bit concerned on the thrust weight in the Central Core, but we'll look at it. We'll, we'll play with it. It's fine. Let's put that little piece on there so you can see if it's rolling. Right? And just make it sort of look like that. Make it all orange. <laughs> you want all the uh, the all orange to do it? We could we could actually put more fuel on it, and then we could put uh, we could we we could put more fuel on it, and then we could put SRBs on the outside. <laughs> now we're having too much fun. That's twelve sixteen. I really wish that number said fifteen hundred, but the thrust weight in that central core stage is just not going to be great. Uh, each one of those is 1,500. That means that you could get by if we use the modded engine. If those are rocking 3,000 apiece, you could just take off with two of those. Those are hacky, cheaty engines. 334 at sea level. <laughs> Hacks. <laughs> yes, RBs. SRBs? More like yes, RBs. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> You don't have to tell me twice. This is a very Kerbal rocket. We could put kickbacks on it? <laughs> really? That's impressive. How big is a kickback, though? Okay, that's not... Oh, okay. That's the thumper, so the kickback is going to be massive. <laughs> that looks like a bouncy castle. <laughs> that looks like a that honestly looks like a bouncy castle. This is the most Kerbal of rockets this way. <laughs> the SRBs are so affordable though, Doss. Jeez. Nah, let's not use the standoff ones. Let's use the uh, shorter ones. And this has rapidly become Doss designs a rocket day. As opposed to Doss is answering questions. <laughs> okay. That's pretty close. Put it like that and slap some nose cones on it and call it a Deo. Alright. Um, all these engines are going to light at the same time as that. Then we're going to decouple that. We don't need stage four. I guess we could have crossfed, actually. We could have put more fuel on it, and we could have turned on a, another skipper. But what's our thrust to weight? 181. Need to look at sea level. 157. So we could put more fuel on it if we needed to. And then... That's giving us over 2,000 delta V. Barely over 2,000 delta V. We're still only at 32. I still wouldn't expect this to go to orbit. Um, I would expect that we would really want to put more fuel in this right there, because that 2.05 is really good. But I would expect these boosters need more fuel, right? Instead of making them look like pencils. Let's uh, see what we can do. What is that one? 540. 440. Whatever, man. You do you. It's not really very much fuel. That looks cool, though. Do, do, do. Oh, that's not right. <laughs> do we have the smaller? That's not right, either. Those look ridiculous. <laughs> I don't care how hanky it is. I love putting tanks above SRBs in cross-feeding. You, sir, are a dirty, filthy cheater. <laughs> and I love you for it. It's fine. I guess we're just going to make the boosters longer, right? Let's just make the boosters longer. Like another one of these tanks longer, probably. That's okay. That's not correct. That's more correct. The I, I don't really think I can make the central core much more, and I can't actually extend the boosters up unless I put a shorty nose cone on them. So, 
That's 1.65 thrust to weight. That's 1.43 thrust to weight, actually, but our staging looks... A little, no, that's, quick. that's okay. That's 1.43. And then when we ditch those, we go to a 1.57 thrust to weight, so we're okay. That is giving us... I guess I'm going to have to lock down all this because I don't want to see this Delta V. I just want it to be dead mass payload. That's only 3,082 Delta V. It's 3530. Bam. 3530. I think we can make do with 3530. It looks super curbly. I didn't, I didn't design it to look like a rocket. I designed it to look like a Kerbal rocket. But let's give it a, let's give it the old test flight and just see what it does. At some point, you just either have to fly or get off the pot, and it's time for us to to light this candle, I believe. Oh, eh, attach it up there. Give it a little bit of more structural stability, so it's not on that same part that the engines are attached to. Attach that to there. Oh, I could have put fuel in there down on the bottom. Whatever, it's already attached. Can you add some more solids to the center and air light them? Probably, but let's let's see. Usually, if, if you're going 1,500 in your first stage, your lifter and your sustainer, if you're going 1,500 in the first stage and 2,000 in the second stage, you need a higher thrust to weight in that second stage. But we flipped the script here, and we've got 1,500 plus 779. So we're over 2,000 in, in the lift stage. And I believe that's going to get us to a fast enough, like a high enough velocity that the sustainer will take it to orbit just fine with a half thrust to weight. Uh, 0.5 thrust to weight should be fine. I would be more concerned about it if the lifter petered out at 1,500 and then the sustainer had to go the last 2,000. But because of the way this has sort of worked out, I think we'll be okay. Go, Tug Tato. You didn't think this was going to be like a five-minute thing, did you, Neon? <laughs> you didn't think this was a... You didn't think you were going to show up over here and have me do this in five minutes or something. We could actually, We could actually put a tail cone on the central skipper and then deploy the tail cone when the skipper turns on. <laughs> you almost have to. <laughs> Just for fashion purposes. <laughs> so that people don't know that there's a skipper in the middle that we're, we're not lighting. In real life, you probably wouldn't do this, right? You've, you've paid to put that engine on there, so you would probably want that engine to be running the entire time. You would probably not want the engine not to be used. So uh, I just think that that looks kind of cool. And then when we light that, we can actually decouple that boat tail. It's like a, it's like a deployable boat tail. You didn't think it'd be the whole stream, but that, I mean, I'm having fun with it. So we do need to do this, however. Um, and this is actually sort of sketchy. I do not, I do not love what's happening here. Those are going to hit that engine. That one hit the side of the engine bell. Hmm. There you go. Nah, that one hit too. Meh, let's see how it flies. Whatever. Super, super secret engine. I guess we could, I guess we could strut past this. And actually strut into the fairing like that. Not particularly realistic, but whatever, right? I'm super curious how this is going to fly. I do believe that we need, we probably don't need those interior struts there, right? We probably just need those four struts that I put on that magically go through the fairing. And then we could also do this number. Like that. And the fairing, those struts will go through the fairing and we would just pretend that they have an explosive frangible nut bolt, whatever, that de decouples them right there. All right, we'll see if this goes into orbit. I mean, I don't know. Don't act like you know. Nobody knows. That's pretty. Should we put a launch tower on it too? All right, so we light everything and we release that, like that, and then we decouple that, and then we ditch the boat tail and light the center core and ditch those, and they should peel off very coral heavy. 
Um, then we pop the fairing. Then we have the upper stage, and there's no upper upper stage, right? What's the part count? Yes, it's 131 parts, and its mass is just under 400 tons. So we are good to launch, it looks like, with this craft so far. And it looks super sketchy. <laughs> These little holes in the middle, real rockets would not have little holes like that, okay? But uh, we're sort of designing within what we have. Let's see what this goes. Let's see, we'll say a uh, tug potato launch launch slap a logo on it there you go designed by Kerbal Space Academy save it and uh, let's just put this out test it see how it flies right we do have the probe core and everything on board mm -hmm. we don't have a control point that's directly on the center line of the tug. We've offset the probe core, which is okay, but we don't have a docking port or any other type of control point that's on the center line, which is usually a bit of a no-no. We could do that, and we could have that as a docking port and as our grapple target, and then that also gives us a control point right at the middle of everything. Yeah, I, I think it's okay if we grapple to that docking port. I think that that's okay. I could I could back it off so you don't even get to the docking port, and then we could just control from there by default. But I think it's going to be okay to grapple to that docking port. And if it's not, we grapple slightly off the side of the docking port, and we just deal with it. Let's see how it flies. All right, three, two, one. Are we in vacuum? Sea level? All right. Let's see if we can get it to orbit. I, I don't know that it's going to get as high as it needs to in orbit, right? But let's see. Luckily, you had like 2.5 million ker bucks, so we had money to spend. Oh, and around light in the docking board? Keep adding fashion. <laughs> oh, so fresh and so clean. Throttles are up. Panels locked. SAS is engaged. This is uh, a launch. This is running ultra hardcore. We can recover, revert it if we need to, but honestly, do an alt F5 and tell it to call it a quick save. And let's see what we get here. Five, four, Three, two, one. Ah, ah, ah. One is the num shall be the number of counting. I don't know. So we had a nominal thrust to wait. So I'm gonna send this thing straight up. Oh man, look at that thing clawing its way. What's up now, surly bonds? Um, I'm gonna go straight up. I'm gonna start leaning over like this. Typical launch trajectory because we did we did it on the bounce by the numbers. That's cool. A little bit of a roll when I commit it to pitch, which is interesting. Oh, it's probably because I'm not controlling from the docking board I just put in there. I'll be fine. We'll deal with it. That's probably when I tell it to roll that it's pitching a little bit. So we've got SRB burnout, and we've got one Korolev cross. Excellent. Continue our lean here. Could have been more aggressive, I think. Yeah, we definitely could have been more aggressive there on the turn. So let's stay near the bottom of this. And the pitch is giving a little bit of a natural roll, which actually makes it fashionable as it launches, I think. It's a chunker. <laughs> let's watch our Apo. There you go. I'm going to see if I can't control from uh, the docking port. Still not getting it. There you go. Control from there. All right. Hopefully that makes it stop rolling. So we're still burning here, and we're going all the way up to like a buck twenty or something, if I'm not mistaken, right? Let's damp out, damp out that roll. And we'll see. Our time to Apo is almost two minutes, which is good. Oh, <laughs> dude, <laughs> look at that. This fairing looks ridiculous, but dude, look at that. And we're sitting on a pretty good amount of Delta V. Let's push this thing all the way up. It's not bad right now with a 141, and we're not quite pushing Apo. I'm going to try to send it all the way up to 120. You turn late? 
Neon, uh, typically this launch would have been more efficient if we were at a 45 degree angle relative to the eastern horizon when we were at about 10 to 12k. This is an aerodynamic rocket. We're not launching like an exposed truss for the International Space Station or anything like that. So this rocket would have been most efficiently launched, or not most efficiently launched, but more efficiently launched at a 45 degree angle pitch relative to the horizon at 10k is what we typically shoot for for a trajectory. And I didn't, I was, I was too busy worrying about the roll and then trying to get in there to control from the docking port, which I should have done while we were still on the launch pad. And uh, I should have been worrying about that, right? We can pop the fairing. We get rid of a little bit of mass. That's going to give us some more Delta V. Not much, though, because this is a chunk and 50 ton, 50 ton tug, right? At this point, I'd almost feel good if I was running a poodle or something instead, but we're just going to roll with it. I'll go for 120. We'll see how much Delta V we have left. <clears throat> Launch in a big old roll of toilet paper. <laughs> yes. We're social distancing from the ground is what we're doing. Uh, still pushing. Time to Apple is dropping, but it's not dropping at a second per second, so we're fine. Uh, we actually just pushed. So we will have a bit of a cut where we cut our engine. We have a coast phase. We didn't go through like all the normal rocket things where we'll put some RCS in control and stuff like that over here. We didn't go through that for this launch. Uh, we were just sort of pushing this thing into orbit, right? That's some extreme social distancing. <laughs> I, I popped the fairing based on the drag of the payload. So a super draggy payload, it is almost always better to carry the fairing for longer than to pop the fairing too low and then take the penalty for all the drag, right? Um, if it's a very aerodynamic payload, well, why'd you have a fairing in the first place? But uh, if it's an aerodynamic payload, I'll pop the fairing earlier since I'm not going to take a huge drag penalty. You know? This thing is still hauling the mail. I don't think it's going to go all the way to a buck twenty, but we'll see. I don't, I don't think this stage is going to circularize. More throttle, less efficient? So, no. Um, it doesn't model efficiency changes based on throttle right now. It does model efficiency changes based on different types of engines, and also, just one second, 3, 24, 25, uh, 24. And also atmospheric density and that sort of stuff, but it doesn't do anything by throttle. So let's go ahead and do that, do that. How much to circularize? Because we're basically almost in orbit already. <laughs> it's 91 <laughs> to make orbit. And we got a buck fifty-eight in the tank. We could actually push the apple higher to a buck fifty or something like that. But we weren't doing that actually. We weren't doing that. We're we're not putting it all the way up that high. We were gonna rendezvous at like eighty or something like that. Cause it was like three or four hundred less delta V. So we don't need to circularize. We just need the parry to end up at 80. Why did that take turn up? There you go. Is that what we're doing? 80? I mean, that's going to be a super fast rendezvous. You know something? We'll see if 80 works. It's fine. 54 to, to go into a little bit of an elliptical orbit there. And we could actually use that stage to slow it down. Uh, Apple at 12 mil? No, no, no. CFT, no. We want we want it to be low because we did the test. And it was something like 400 delta V because of, I'm going to go with Oberth, uh, closer to the planet. And uh, so we, we want to be a little bit closer. I mean... What in tarnation was that? <laughs> Just every RCS port. Who wrote the software that controls these RCS ports? Jeez. <laughs> we can go to the other side of the planet and circularize it. I should have shot for 80. That's okay. That's okay. All right. There we go. Let's just warp to the next maneuver. At this point, we're going to chop, chop, and try to get some of this stuff done, shall we? 
Close period, but you thought you wanted Apo way out there for max speed at parry. Oh, Apo, yes, Shady, but we still have to calculate that. We haven't actually calculated the phasing orbit yet. Up next is going to be the, the, the sort of linchpin to all of this, right? How we're going to get this done. I'm going to show you how to do a two-node phased rendezvous where you have something that's hyperbolic and something that's elliptical in having the game calculate the period such that they match. Missed the burn. Whatever. I'm running my mouth again. What is this? Rocket science? Jeez. What do we got there on my Apo? Perry, 78, 79, littering end, 80. Good. All right. So just really quickly, we're still sitting on 104 in that stage. We didn't make it an accelerant, uh, an intelligent stage, y'all. So I'm going to leave this up as, a, as an exercise to the user. Um, had we gone through and put a probe core on that stage, we could have actually deorbited it. But for now, we're going to leave it in orbit. We should have put a little bit of uh, command and control on it so that after it separated from its payload, it was still able to turn itself around and deorbit itself so we didn't leave space junk. It's 36.5, it'd be sitting on 70, 65, and we'd still be good, right? Why don't you use warped maneuver in the HUD? Wait, in the HUD? I usually just click here and do warp to maneuver. Where is there is where is there another warp to maneuver button? I did warp to maneuver and it put me 60 seconds out and then I time warped manually the rest of the way. Um I'm I'll just time warp around here. But yeah, I usually I usually do warp to maneuver. The dot dot in green. That Huh, I've never used that. <laughs> I've never used that before. You know why? Because I'm an old, salty Kerbal player, and I have thousands of hours before that was ever a thing. How's that? All right, I, I don't ever use that. <laughs> Back in my day, if we wanted to warp to the maneuver node, we had to do it manually. And if you missed, <laughs> you just had to deal with it. Too bad. Ah, uh, yes. All right, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, da, da, da. It's really not good that that... Anyways, whatever. That stage is going to be flying with us. There you go. So we have another 68, point, 68 meters per second of Delta V in there. I don't even know that we want this stage on here. Um, I think we just sep this. I mean, we could use the tug to push it out of orbit. W what was the point if that was the case, right? I think we're just going to set this, and we should have we should have put a probe core on this so that we could deorbit this cleanly using its remaining delta V is what we should have done. Y'all want me to launch it again? Do you want to see the launch again? And we can make this an intelligent upper stage, and we can do a little bit more efficient launch? Or do you want me to just keep going forwards? Y'all call. Your call. Whatever you want to do. And Neon, I mean, I don't even know how much time you have. For all I know, you needed to go like two hours ago. Just send it. You would like a launch again. I say keep going. Probe core, that sucker. I think since what we want to get to is the rendezvous, <clears throat> I, think, I think we just decouple it and we just delete that stage. So we could just keep going, because the more important thing, you know that you could do the exact same thing I did right here, right? It's just a pro, it's a nose, a little tiny 625 nose cone and a probe core. You could have put a battery on it and you could have put that on this stage to make it an intelligent upper stage. And then you could have decoupled this. And then after you decoupled it, you could have actually just had this thing turn around and then deorbit itself, right? That's that's the right thing. You know you could have done that, so we won't spend time on that right now. Um, let's go ahead and decouple like that. So now we have Tugtato in orbit. Tugtato. And we will actually rename it Tugtato. I like it. Look at it. It looks like a fat pig swimming. Kind of. It actually does look like a pig. <laughs> I'm playing like ultra hardcore rules, like we'll do pulse control with no SAS on. There you go. And then we'll have the reaction wheels lock it in. 
Um, and this thing would just get deleted. You should have been editing this the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's like a, it's a unicorn pig. It literally looks like a pig. Like it's got little piggy arms, little piggy legs. For some reason, a unicorn horn, a piggy goatee. <laughs> All of these other things, right? <laughs> there you go. Good deal. We need to go through several years of your own rocket photos. Nice. <laughs> Suey. All right, so... We've got this in an 80-kilometer orbit. We need to get the other spacecraft, the incoming spacecraft, also in an 80-kilometer orbit. And we'll go ahead and do another hard quick save there in case we need to come back, right? But let's go... Over here to our other craft and uh, literally just switch to this puppy. So there's our maneuver node coming up in three days. Let's go ahead and close that down. Everything over here should be pretty good. The solar panels point towards the sun and stuff. Um, we will disarm this. Like that. Not that it really matters up here. And uh, let's just time warp to this maneuver node. We have those quick saves in there, so we can we can do our thing. Let's use this new thing that I learned. To point that at that. Make sure we're not going to run out of electric charge. We're, with this design, This I like this design for the solar panels. Uh, we're probably not going to run out of electric charge there. See? And we could just time warp till the next maneuver. Just get it done. I uh, better confirm we're controlling from the right place and everything. Control from there. The engine's online. It has fuel. It's 534.6 delta V. We can actually use monoprop to clean it up some. Let's see what we get. Let's see what we get. Pig, pig potato. <laughs> it's like a full meal. <laughs> it's not just a rescue tub. It's a full meal. Um, I'm just going to tell it to time warp. All right, so this maneuver had us attacking or approaching Kerbin at a periapsis that is way wrong. What is happening? Aha. There's some sort of time warp problem happening. We're going to have to move the maneuver node out of it. Because it ain't right. It's a loaded potato. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't wait in orbit. You can't actually push it forward from time. Can you? Oh no, you can. You can push it forward with with seconds of time. Oh, good. It's good. There, it's not 17 minutes out. All right, we're good. Oh, that's right. We probably burned during the screenshot. That's right. I am. I I'm whistling without using my lips. Yes. <laughs> which, <laughs> which, which. So I'm just gonna get this thing right around the equator because now it's minutes away there you go and now I need to get the periapsis down to 80 and at minimum tick that's the periapsis of 32 that's the periapsis of 92 eh, 80 that's okay he's okay he's okay and that's pretty darned close. We would need to wait until we got a little bit closer to actually clean that up, I think. I could also just match the inclination in ascending descending node because I'm, I'm not going to be able to edit that using the clicks. I don't even think that editing it using the numbers will work. You know? But that gets us pretty darn close. We could, yeah, we could use the RCS to make up the difference. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one, Loopy. So now let's time warp again. And now that we've set this thing up, make sure it's, yeah, it's prograde and everything. All right, so let's just time warp and do the thing. Like Mech Jeb do the burn? I don't even know how to do that. So no, I'm not going to let Mech Jeb do the burn. <laughs> I thought you wanted to rescue these poor Kerbals, not strand them here forever. 
Why didn't Mechjeb already rescue him if Mechjeb was going to be rescuing him? So we'll just do a quick save right here and, and give it a try. 22 seconds. 15 seconds. 7, 6, 5. Stand by, chat. Burn coming up. 3, 2, 1. Ignition. It's about a 30 second burn here. Mechjeb fuel consumption. I know, right? You know what'd be cool if we could do both burns at the same time? It's within four meters per second. All right. No enemies, no enemies, stop! 261, RCS on. Find control on. It did not like that inclination. Look at that. 8052, but the inclination's whack. Interesting. It must have not followed the burn exactly right, right? But that's okay. That's okay. That's not a problem at all. Um, let, me actually, let me actually just go look at this. Let's, let's see if we can change the inclination. Oh, that was easy. There you go. I'm about to go thrust limit the RCS. That's fine right there. It's just a nudge. It's just a nudge. So now, okay. So now we're getting into the, the two maneuver node phasing rendezvous, right? This is the basic setup for the two maneuver node phasing rendezvous. And you can use this when you're super lazy and you want to go directly to your space station. Do not pass go. Do not collect however many Delta Vs. Um, you got one out of the moon. You got one out of Minmus. If you set up your space station in a certain orbit, this incoming craft, the, the craft we're rescuing, could actually be a cargo mission or a transfer shuttle or something like that that wants to come into this orbit and just immediately rendezvous with the space station. That is, that is something, that, or, or whatever else we're rendezvousing with here, right? It doesn't need to be the space station because I'm going to phase this other orbit. Um, but the next thing that we do now that we have this set up is we switch back to the Tug Tato launch, right? And we're going to calculate some maneuver nodes that make these things intersect with each other. So I'll come over here, wherever that other ship is, there it is, and I'm going to set that as my target, right? I want to set that as my target. And you can see right now, um, it is not happy at all. It thinks that we're going to be way out. Th that's well done, Kerbal. Well done. That's just, that is exactly the way that that should work. That is just great. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Add a maneuver. Add another maneuver. Let me see if I can trick it into working. Okay, there's that. So that's our next approach. This may be so far out, we might not be able to do it this way because we're going to have to wait too many orbits. We may actually have to make this thing get closer before we can do this because it is a year away, right? Um, no matter how many orbits I wait, yeah, we're going to have to wait until this thing gets closer. I can't calculate it yet because we're a year away, right? So let's go ahead and close this down, and we'll time warp up until it gets into the SOI, and then we'll do this. Let's get it into the SOI, and then we will do this. So let's switch back over to our other craft, because normally we're not a year away when we do this, right? But I'm just going to tell it to time warp all the way down into the SOI. And we'll F5 again. Go back to Kerbin. Focus the view. And to literally just say, hey... Warp to there. One year, 52 days. So that craft is going to come falling down. Kerbin is going to keep on keeping on. Oh, Kerbin's actually going to make an orbit. <laughs> I'll take things that I didn't realize for 500, please. Kerbin is going to make an entire orbit. 
because it's more than a year away. Duh. <laughs> I'm thinking in Duna scales because in Ultra Hardcore Career we were plotting trajectories the Duna, and uh, this is uh, <laughs> this is a much longer scale. <laughs> That's okay. It doesn't change anything. We're still fine. <laughs> what is SOI and why is it important for the calculation? So SOI stands for Sphere of Influence. And the game has a sort of simplistic view of how orbital mechanics work. Um, think about gravity, right? And if you're here standing on the beach, the Earth's gravity is holding you down to the Earth. Right, because gravity, that's how it works. And, and if you know how gravity works, there's also a little bit of your gravity pulling on the Earth, too, because you have mass, therefore you have gravity. Um, but what happens when you're standing on the beach? Waves come up, the tide comes in, right? Well, the tide comes in and out because it's not just the Earth's gravity that's important. The moon's gravity also has an effect on everything that's on Earth, and we can see it in the tides, right? So the same thing is true for spacecraft. Spacecraft are in orbit of the Earth, but they are also being influenced by the gravity of the moon. And they're being influenced by the gravity of the sun, and they're being influenced by the gravity of Jupiter a little bit, right? So in real life, and I think we're just about to where we needed to be. Yeah, there we go. Um, in real life, I'm going to pause the game right quick. Everything that has mass exerts a gravitational pull on everything else that has mass, right? Like everything has gravity. But in order to calculate that, the game is not set up. The math in the game doesn't try to calculate... Well, here's your orbit based on the mass of the spacecraft and the mass of the Earth. But then the moon is also over here, and it's going to change your orbit like this. And then Midmus is over here, and it's not doing what's called n-body physics, which means lots of bodies being put in the calculations to try and see what you should do, right? It uses a really simplistic model that just says, I am only going to calculate your orbit based on one thing at a time. Not the Earth and the moon and all these other things. But when you're in the sphere of influence of the Earth or of Kerbin, that's all I'm going to use to calculate your orbit. Right, And when I get close enough to the moon, the game has a crossing point, and it's like, okay, you are exiting the sphere of influence of Kerbin, and you're entering the sphere of influence from the moon. It's like, it's like the crossover point where the moon's gravitational pull is more important to the game than Kerbin's gravitational pull. So you cross over to the sphere of influence, right? That's, that's what you do. You cross over to a different SOI. So that's, uh, that's what an SOI is, and that's what it's in, why it's important to the game, Tominator. Um, it has a simplistic model of how orbits work and how orbital mechanics work, and it only calculates based on one body at a time, and that body is the body that you're in the sphere of influence of. So we should still have time to go into an elliptical orbit. Yeah, we should, we should still have time to go into an elliptical orbit. So we're here. We have it down to 80. Um, now that we're in the SOI, periapsis is a day and an hour away. So let's try to phase this. Let's go back to the tug tato, right? Switch back to the tug tato here. This is why KSP is great at teaching basics, but it creates small bad habits. So Dr. Slaughter, what is a small bad habit that KSP would teach? Uh, I'm really curious to see what a small bad habit would be. I, I'm super interested in a small bad habit. So now that this thing is coming in on this, this hyperbolic trajectory, right? Hyperbolic? Parabolic? Hyperbolic. Um, I have my craft in a circular orbit. I have my incoming craft in this orbit, and they both sort of match. They both have this periapsis, or they, they both have an 80-kilometer orbit, where they sort of, the lines touch, I guess, is the best way to say it. See, those lines touch. So I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to put a maneuver node where the lines touch, like that. And I'm going to put a maneuver node over here as well, like that. And the reason of having two maneuver nodes is I'm tricking the game into calculating what I needed to calculate, right? You can see right now, the next time I come around here, that craft is going to be way up there, right? And if I right click on this and tell it to wait in orbit, that craft is going to move towards us, see? So every time I do another orbit, that craft is going to move down its orbit. And you can see we go from, okay, it gets kind of close, but then it's going ridiculously fast, and then it is going to be way past us, right? So one orbit, it's going to be right here, and I'm going to be right here, and it's going so fast, by the, t the next time I come around, whenever it ends, whenever I get back to here again, it's going to be all the way over there. So that's a problem, right? I need to change my orbital period 
right here, the amount of time it takes me to go around this orbit, so that when I get right here, the spacecraft is right there as well. So here's how we do that. We're gonna back that off some, and we're gonna put those way back up there so we're not waiting any orbits, right? Or we're, we're waiting just a small amount of orbits. And then over here, I'm actually gonna change my craft. I'm going to give it some delta V and see how we change our orbit here. And if I come back to this one, I should get some different answers. There you go. So by changing my orbit like that, now I don't have to wait any orbits. In the time that it takes me to go around here, that spacecraft's gonna be here. So watch what I can do. I don't even need to wait any orbits, it doesn't look like. I just need to get rid of that game bug that's never been fixed. And I need to just increase the period of this orbit. And the more I increase the period of this orbit, look at that orbit come down. The closest approach gets closer and closer the more time I get that. And I can get it just right. Well, it's going to be easier if I use this all the way down. I can get it just right so that I have a 2.1 kilometer intersect with a relative velocity of 1,400 meters per second. So actually, that's not that bad, actually. Right? Um, so that is what we want to do. Does everybody see what I did there? I need to do that burn. It's only going to be 700 meters per second. I have Delta V on board. We've just locked the fuel tanks, right? And if we unlock those fuel tanks, you can see that we're rocking 1668, and this first burn is going to be 796, right? Does that make sense to everyone? It's a, it's a two-node phasing rendezvous. The only reason we have this node is because we're trying to trick the game into doing this. I'm going to do it again from scratch to show you. Because there's some there's some bugs with the maneuver nodes that really make them annoying. Um, and in fact, I, for this one, we might not even need two maneuver nodes. Since we let it get into the SOI, we may just add a maneuver and increase that orbital period until we get a rendezvous. Yeah, we don't even need to wait an orbit. This thing is coming in so hot, we don't even need to wait an orbit. Bink. Pull this backwards. Oh, come on. Oh, gosh. Stop. Okay, good. What's our separation? 9.8? Okay, wait. Did it. Separation is 2.6 kilometers. There you go. So I didn't even need the other maneuver node for this because this craft is coming in so fast. If you were just coming down from Minmus, um, it would be 8 days, 10 days, something like that, coming down from Minmus. So you might want to tell it to wait in orbit, wait in orbit, wait in orbit with that second node. But because this craft is coming in so fast, we can literally just do it with a single node, and it's super simple to get that encounter there. So we're going to burn 796 now, and then we're going to uh, burn another relative velocity 1500 to actually match our speeds. I've actually never known how to intercept a hyperbolic object before. This makes so much sense. There you go, Kuju man. <laughs> I am happy to help. We need. I need to get this burn going. Let me get over to the node, it's 17 seconds. I do need to be sort of precise on that. The important part is that you're changing your period. That's exactly right. The important part is that you're changing your orbital period because it takes time for that other craft to come down. There you go, three, two, one, ignition. Masa minnow, masa minnow. We are controlling from there, right? And again, this thing doesn't have a very great thrust to weight. Um, what is our thrust to weight right now? I really care about the acceleration. 0.33, so you're looking at about 3.3 .3 meters per square second. <clears throat> yeah. But you're right. You, you, have to, you have to increase your velocity to... What you're doing is you're changing the energy of your orbit, and you're changing it in such a way that it has a specific period, and you, you put enough energy into the orbit in a specific way to change its period just right, so that the next time you swing around your orbit, you end up meeting that other spacecraft. That's what it is. Isn't it the simply the same time to increase your speed to match the incoming craft? The increase of orbit is just a consequence of that as well as the period. Not so much, so NASCO, no. Um, we do need to increase our speed to match the speed of the incoming thing, but we also need to be at a very specific place in orbit when we do that, right? So it's not just, oh, we're both going the same speeds, it's we're both going the same speeds and we're both at the same place in space at the same time. That's the most important thing. Shirk also works for choosing where you intercept a target in a closed orbit. With plane two burn home and transfer, you might end up with an intercept that's on the dark side or something. 
But with a burn in the middle, you can have the intercept of the enemy. That's, that's true, Wizard. That is true. It is going to take us a lot of Delta V to catch this thing. And this thing is going to be hauling the mail out of the system <clears throat> whenever we're done with it. It's going to be a, it, this thing's going to be moving fast. This thrust rate is going to be challenging to catch up in time. We have a plan for that. We can plot a maneuver node, and the maneuver node will calculate when we should start the burn to uh, make it happen in advance. It would be easier if we had a lot higher thrust to weight on this one. Hi, Hen. You getting ready to lay down? Okay. I'm just about done. We're just about capturing the spacecraft. Okay. Love you. Yeah, it is, it is going to be tricky. A uh, much higher thrust to weight on this one might have been a lot better. We might have been able to get by with a skipper on this puppy. If we had the big KR2L, KR2L would have been a fantastic engine for this, this design. Those are 3.75. Those aren't the 5 meters. I think at one point I said those were 5 meters, but those are 3.75, not 5 meters. Welcome back to the NASCO. <laughs> Thank you very much for the sub, NASCO. I appreciate the support. Somebody put some hearts in chat for NASCO. I do appreciate you very much. This is this is what I do for a living. I'm not a photographer. I'm not a writer. I just, this is my job. I play Kerbal on the internet. And do virtual pitch and live streams and that sort of stuff. I play Kerbal on the internet. So thank you for letting me continue on with this wacky job. And we are going to have a lot of cleaning up to do here, right? We're going to have to change our periapsis. Da -da -da -da. We are going to have to have some cleanup because this long burn is going to be prone to some errors. But we'll see how it works, right? I've been practicing social distancing since before it was cool. <laughs> Kuju, Hydra, Shady, Negative, thank you for putting hearts in chat for NASCO B. Uh, yes, there's never anything that... It, there's ne I can never do enough to say thank you for supporting me. So, i got to ask other people to help me out. <laughs> there we are, 70. 60 on my mark. Mark. 50. 40, 30, 20, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, stop. There you go, within a half. Now, this is super important. Look at how much we're going to be off because of that half burn. We're way off. This orbital period has to be exact. I brought RCS for this purpose. I'm literally just using my RCS to go forward and I'm using that RCS to fine tune the orbital period until we got a 2.2 kilometer intercept. RCS is so useful that you want to put up a GPS satellite, you want to have a, a GPS satellite needs a very specific orbit because you want the orbital period of the satellite. I guess it's not a GPS satellite, it's really a geosynchronous satellite, geosynchronous satellite. But uh, the Keosynchronous Satellite needs its orbital period to be the exact same as the time it takes one Kerbin day to go over. And that keeps the satellite to be in one position over the equator of Kerbin, right? Um, a Keostationary Satellite there. And so if you're trying to put up a comm network or something, put RCS on and you can use the RCS to fine tune your orbit and get that encounter exactly where we want it to be as opposed to, oh, the main engine, you know. Um, so CFT Teague, or CFT, the next thing that we're going to do is actually plot this encounter so the game can help us figure out where we're supposed to do the burn. And I'm literally just going to put down another maneuver node right here, and I am going to match these two arcs. Like that. And that's not even exactly right. It looks like we have a little inclination problem. And that also puts us outside the curve a little bit. That's close, though. There, we need more delta V. That's pretty close, but it's still not exactly right where that node is. Two days, two hours. Two days, two hours, 22 minutes. I think we just clean this up manually. That's probably pretty close. I'm literally just making the lines match. And that's telling me, it's like, dude, you don't have enough delta V. Well, we do. We just have a locked fuel tank right now. And if we unlock this fuel tank, that shows that we're sitting on 5,600 delta V, and we're going to need 1,400 of that to go. 
Should have relative speed at intercept. Use that to target Delta V in the maneuver. That's right. This says 1410. Well, now that I have the maneuver there, it's not going to show me that. I think this is pretty close, though. I think I think this is pretty close. I was literally just eyeballing it in a very non-NASA fashion, right? <laughs> is all I was doing. So it's a 4 minute 42 second burn. That is a very long burn. I am not in love with that burn time, but let's F5 right here and see if this works out. All right, that's in one day zero hours because we have this big orbit. And let's see how this works. Here you can actually see this craft is going to be falling down, increasing its speed. This craft is going to be going up, decreasing its speed, and then falling down, increasing its speed. And let's let's see if they end up at the same place. I did a quick save. All right, there you go. So now we'll just do the time warp again. Let's let's gut check it and just tell it to time warp up to here. So we fly up. Our orbital velocity is decreasing. Our altitude is increasing. The energy of our orbit stays the same. Potential versus kinetic energy. And then this thing continues to accelerate. It's fallen down. So let's time warp to here. Two hours, 42 minutes. Three hours, 28 minutes. Yep, let's time warp down a little bit more. Curb Curie 1X is falling down, increasing its orbital velocity. It's 3,200 meters per second now. And we're also falling down. We're increasing our velocity as well. So that's not bad. 45 minutes before our burn is supposed to start. Let's just keep time warping manually here. Our target craft continues to fall and increase its velocity. The closer it gets to Kerbin, the faster it's going to get going. And we're doing the same thing. We're increasing our velocity as well. When we get to the bottom, I expect my velocity to be much higher than a typical just 80 kilometer orbit. Because we're coming we're coming down this big slide. We have this big ramp we're coming down, right? Six minutes, five minutes, four, three, two, one minute. All right. So now that thing is hauling the mail. It's going 4,000 meters per second and accelerating like crazy. And we're up to 2,800. So normally we'd be at 2,300. We're going 2,800. So let's see. We have to make up this difference by starting the burn at the right time. And it's we're not even going to be able to see it because this is going to be this is going to be crazy. 32, 31, 30, 29, 28. I guess I'm not really concerned that we don't see an encounter there. Probably better to come up from behind it than to be too far in front of it. But I imagine it's going to go blowing by us at a ridiculous speed. All right, we're all good. F5. Let's just go ahead and light this candle. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, blah 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 blah. One. Maybe eventually it'll do one. There you go. I don't know what the distance to the target is right now. That thing is barreling down somewhere behind us. And we are going to try to get going fast enough so that when it goes flying past, we're close enough that we can catch up to it. 42.61. There we just slingshot it off the moon. Good thing that's not a thing. 42.78. We're already at 3,000, so we're accelerating. It is definitely catching us, though. Periapsis should go down, but I w the periapsis should go back up again. <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not too worried about scraping the atmosphere. That is us ejecting, or something. Jeez, <laughs> that's waggy. Periapsis continues to drop, but I don't think it's going to drop under. Is that target behind us yet? It's not within 100 kilometers. It's still going at more than a kilometer per second difference. It's somewhere in the sky behind us. It's not going to show us our periapsis there. I guess the periapsis there would work, 77. Oh, man, that thing's hauling. Look, it's coming up behind us. I don't know what the distance the target is. 125, 124. Every second, it's, it's gaining on us by a kilometer. So we have 100 seconds before it passes us. We keep trying to bleed that off, but... <laughs> Go, Tugtato! I think Tugtato might have needed a bigger engine for this uh, high-energy encounter. I'm just looking in the sky when it gets under 100 kilometers. Oh, it should be there. Yeah, there it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> that thing is straight hauling the mail, y'all. That thing is 
all in the mail. It's a little bit more than 100 seconds. I just make up numbers on the fly, but now it's only closing at eight, like 0.85 kilometers per second. And pretty soon it'll be closing at a half kilometer per second and yada, yada, yada. Does it have fuel left to help slow itself down? It does stealthy sumo, but for this, um, we'll just we'll just keep going with the tug. Let's see if we did the math correctly. 62 kilometers, closing at almost 750. <laughs> this, is, this thing is crazy. We didn't forget CFT. I, I am more comfortable controlling it all from here for the encounter. If we need to do some corrective burns, we could actually do the corrective burns with that other craft and use its Delta V to clean up the rendezvous here. Um... I don't know that I want to try to switch to the other craft and then turn its engine on and turn it around and use it to slow down. It's 30 kilometers away, closing at 600 meters per second. We're still burning like crazy. I wish you could right-click on that and make it stick, but it doesn't work. 30 kilometers out, closing at 550. Closing at 600, actually. So we're going to need to burn more. We need to make this number zero. 24 kilometers out, it's still coming in at a half kilometer per second. We only have, we have less than 50 seconds now. 20 kilometers out, wow. <laughs> you know something? I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna start playing this by ear. I'm gonna burn over this way and see if we can correct this. We're still closing at 483, 14 kilometers out. It's gonna go blowing past us. We're gonna have to catch up to it. We needed a little bit more thrust in this. It is going to go tearing past us. This would be a good time if we could control both craft to switch to the other craft and have it slow down. Multiplayer, please. Okay, after it gets to a certain distance, I don't want to try and go too sideways. My orbit's going to be too messed up, so I'm just going to go straight here and try to slow down as much as possible. Three kilometers, 300 meters per second. 2.5 kilometers... 2.2, 2.1. We're in physics range now. Still going a quarter kilometer per second past us. There was our 2.0 closest approach. This is pretty cool. <laughs> this is pretty cool, y'all. Three kilometers away. We didn't stop right next to it, but for something that had a relative velocity difference that was thou a thousand meters per second faster than we were going, like 14, 1500 meters per second faster, that's not a bad encounter. We're just going to sort of scoot over to it and get going. And we still have 4,000 Delta V in this stage, so we need 2,000 to capture it. Now, time is of the essence here. We do need to get up to it, and we need to get grappled to it. Let's just completely blow this out, and then I'm going to just try to chase it directly. I'm going to fly right after that thing. I'm going to have to get this up to 100 meters per second or so. I need to catch it. All right, so that should make us catch that target sooner rather than later, and we're going to have to sort of watch it here. But we are flying after it at about a 100 meters per second, so we're already down to 3.7. Let's get flipped around here. I might not actually needed uh, 100 meters per second. I probably could have gotten by with 50 meters per second. But we're almost going to crash into that silly thing. Look. We better start burning right now, because there, there are Kerbals on board. 1.8, 1.7, 1.6, 50, 40, 30, coast in at 30 now. <laughs> this is a bit of a pucker maneuver, yeah. <laughs> Use the fuel in the other vessel to intercept. Still have half a tank in there. We could. Let's just keep going with this. Let's see if the tug does it all itself. I'm, I'm super curious if the tug will be able to do it all itself. Wish I had nav hood, because then we could get just a ridiculously close approach. 500 meters out, closing at 33. 220, closing at 15. 150, closing at 15. We're approaching the correct side. Hey, what's up, Kraft? How you doing? Uh, you guys, uh, need a ride? We've rendezvoused! <laughs> there we go. So we're going to do this super simple mode. 
Um, I am just going to turn the tug so that it is pointing at the target. Right. Hey, you come here often? Nice. Like this. And this is the super simple rendezvous mode. Literally just tell it to point at the target like that. Switch over to the target. We're going to activate this. Make sure we're controlling from the right place. Control from there. <laughs> you make it look so easy. I've done it a couple times. I've done it a couple times. This craft is much lighter, so we can get it pointed pretty easily. And then from here, it's just bog standard docking acquisition. So let's get going towards the target. Feels like I'm upside down right now. I think I am. 0.2 meters per second. Going a little bit faster than that. Could use the other one to approach as well, I guess. <laughs> Speed police, pull over, you're going too fast. Yeah, now both craft are screaming away from Kerman. That's why time is of the essence here. We need to slam on the brakes. We absolutely, positively need to get this grapple done, and we need to slam on the brakes. I want to see what the Delta V is even when this stage is in there. Let's lock down those fuel tanks. Yeah, look at the altimeter. The altimeter is insane. <laughs> there you go. We're docked. So I want to now control from this docking port if I can. I just need to get to it. Yep, control from there. We need to point this puppy retrograde. We haven't we haven't decoupled this. You know something? I'm just going to F5, and I'm literally just going to decouple this. Now that we've attached, let's get pointed retrograde. We're going to whack out. We're going to hit the solar panel on the other thing. Which way is retrograde, please? There it is. We have 2,700 delta V. There's Kerb. I mean, Kerbin is getting smaller. Like, you can see Kerbin getting smaller. Straight up retrograde. We don't even have the other engines, so we don't need to worry about it anymore. And I'm just going to slam on the brakes, y'all. I am literally just going to... Let's fix the staging first. But I just want to slam on the brakes. Like that right there. And let's just get this orbit captured. We do not want to leave the Kerbin system. And we, we really need to be doing that burn down here, but that's the amount of time, that's how fast we were going, right? I can't just confirm that if we burn retrograde, we will capture this way, right? Yes. We will capture. In fact, we need to actually change this burn just a little bit. I may actually want to change the burn. How far is that out? 45 seconds? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me change the burn. Retro to capture and some radial in, like that, 160. I'm already supposed to be starting the burn. I need to make it so I can actually accomplish the burn. There you go. There you go. Get it down to 80. It's supposed to start the burn again. Dead blame it. <laughs> there are 40 seconds. Get it down to 80, like we said. Okay, now we can do that burn. 24, wow, it's 24, 24. <clears throat> and we have 20, that, that radial out is not that much. We've got less than 200 delta V. We should be able to do it, though. I think we're okay. We also have some monoprop. We have 200-something units of monoprop, so we should be fine. Even though this isn't the most efficient thing, we'll, we'll get this thing into the atmosphere. All right, now we'll start the burn and slow down like this and do some radial in so that we can actually capture in a... That's super inefficient. <laughs> that is a super inefficient burn. We probably shouldn't even be doing that burn, but whatever. Orbit should have a lot less energy than it did before. It, we shouldn't be doing the burn this way, y'all. That is, the radial in is never an efficient way to use your delta V. Don't... This is not the right way to do it, but... That's okay. I just want to get this thing going slow enough that we can uh, re-enter it. Might as well use the monoprop as well. 
<laughs> it's like emergency all engines forward, please. <laughs> Monoprop main engines, just use everything you can to slow down. <laughs> use the moon to search areas the cost of some complexity. We might have been able to, yeah. We might have been able to. Always use radial in, got it. No, no, no. Don't always use radial in, please. Usually, never use radial in. <laughs> use radial in to change your periapsis when you're on a hyperbolic trajectory approaching a planet from an interplanetary uh, trajectory or when you're, when you're approaching in the moon from Kerbin. That's the only time where it's okay to do a little nudge like this and get a big change in periapsis on your, on your pass. Do as I say, not as I do. Why not use radial in? Um, the orbital screet maneuver. <laughs> Uh, we don't want to use radial in because uh, what's the right way to say it? Radial in doesn't really change the energy of an orbit. Radial in sort of pivots an orbit. Let me draw it for you. Let me draw it for you. Radial in doesn't doesn't do much to change the energy of your orbit. So slow down, speed up, that sort of stuff. Radial in just sort of deflects your orbit one way or the other. And it can be very expensive. The faster you're going, the more it costs you to deflect your orbit, basically. It's the same like inclination change. You want to be slow while turning. Kind of. Kind of. We needed more... Mo we could have put, like, emergency monoprop thrusters on the back. <gasps> we're actually gaining some delta V because we're using the monoprop, too, so the mass of the monoprop's going down. And then we gain some monoprop because that command module actually had some monoprop, which eh, should we be using, shouldn't we be using, whatever. <laughs> this burn. Jeez. Oh, and that other piece is just going to keep, keep going. We didn't want to pay to slow it down, right? So that other piece is just going to keep on Keep on keeping on. The claw does allow fuel crossfeed. Yeah, if you look at this, it should be drinking monoprop out of that container. So, eh, six of one half dozen of the other. If y'all want to get onto me because I'm using that fuel, I don't know what to tell you. Like, geez, sorry. <laughs> What's our orbit look like? It still hasn't even captured. Jeez. Now, hopefully the tourists don't land on a mountain and die if the lander falls and rolls downhill. <laughs> that would be bad. That's always something we can simulate, you know? Okay, our orbit is starting to curve. That's good. It's start. We're about to capture. I shut the engines down. 80 kilometers. Apoapsis. The most efficient thing to do is not to toast this other 896. The most efficient thing to do is burn down here at the parry. Now that we've captured, we should... Uh... Oh, wow. That's not really changing the periapsis. We should just coast on up for nine days, and then we should come back down again, is what we should do. Should we, should you want me to try and land at the KSC? I can try to land at the KSC, sure. <laughs> I'm just going to go, let's just warp up to the Apo. And I'm going to put that down to like 75 or something. Okay, that said time warp complete, that's fine. One hour to get to Apo, jeez. All right, show me, I guess prograde will also work. And then show me my periapsis over here, please. And literally I can just turn on my RCS and fine tune this. Other way, it was the right way. Burn it Apo to bring it to air brake altitude, then burn it period to handle the rest. Oops, I was gonna go to 75. What I wanted to do, we've got 800 meters per second in the second in the tank. Let's see what 800 meters per second gets us.
I mean, that's what 800 gets us. Then we deorbit on monoprop. Daytime KC? Nah, it's nighttime at the KC. Yeah, it'll be daytime in a bit. I mean, well, we have to go all the way around this big orbit, right? <clears throat> Just arrow break for like a year. <laughs> we could, we probably could have ended up in a circular orbit here. Um, what if we then put 25 up here? I just want to look. Forty-five. That should be good. We're not really doing a targeted reentry here, you know. I'm thinking. I'm thinking we shouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't use all of our delta v doing this. I'm. I'm thinking we should save like a hundred delta v to deorbit. So put this out to. Seven hundred instead, and then try to get some bit of targeting for our orbit. And we can always F5 and see if it works or not, right? But let's do it that way. Let's F5 right here, and let's go all the way down here. We've got 800. So we'll spin 700. We'll have 100 left over. And then we, we can also see where KSC is, you know? Don't hit the moon. Don't hit the moon. Don't, okay, we're fine. Oh, the moon may come all the way around again. <laughs> what an adventure! <laughs> I know, right? I, I mean, I started at 8 because it was family dinner night and uh, got a little bit later start. I did say I was trying to do four hours a day. Whoa, buddy. What are you doing? No, 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 no. <laughs> it was pointing another way. It's just using all sorts of monoprop right now. It's fine. Whatever. <laughs> there we go. All right. So we'll do 702 here, and then we'll go. Yeah, look, we gained one Delta V because we, we vented some monoprop. <laughs> All right, seven, six, five, four, three, two, et cetera, et cetera. We would have had even more if we used that other fuel, you know? But that will lower us down. We'll leave 100 in the tank, and then we'll try to land. Ah, it's nighttime at KSC again. Realistically, we want the bottom of our orbit to be KSC. So if that's 22 minutes away, it would be about two orbits away, because that's an hour and a half. So that may be just over an hour, right? I'm, I'm, I'm slicing the pie is what I'm doing. Slicing the pie. Oh, you want me to keep using monoprop? Okay, we can do that. And I'm just gonna shut down the main engine when we have 100 meters per second of Delta V remaining. And then use that to try and target our deorbit. Feels sliced, nice. I'm just watching the Delta V counter. There we go. All right. So that puts us with a periapsis of 75 and an apoapsis of 413. And uh, this is right here. So I think if we go around, I'm going to F5 right here. And uh, yeah, we only have 97 meters per second of Delta V left. And I'm going to go through one orbit. No, because it's not a 30-minute orbital period, so we should deorbit right meow. We should go right here. We should do 100 meters per second retro. What do we have, 97? Negative 97. Okay, 97 is way too much there. Let's set the periapsis to, like, 35. And this is sort of guest test and revised land. 30. We're not coming in from the moon, so 30 is fine. Oh my gosh, what just happened? Whatever, I'm just going to burn retrograde. It's fine. <laughs> I'm just going to burn retrograde and put the periapsis to negative uh, whatever. But we have too much delta V. All right, let's see where this thing's land. I want it to land in the in the ocean. Oh, 
guess we'll just F5 right here. I mean, there you go. Did I F5? Yeah, I did. Okay. Good luck, everyone. Oh, my. <laughs> the claw, though. It turned around to point prograde. <laughs> what? <laughs> Control from here. All right. And it is pointing retrograde right now. Okay. And you know what I was going to do with the tug? Hey, tug. Point prograde for me. I want you to stay in orbit. <laughs> EDL, yeah. Entry, descent, landing. Nice. So where is our maneuver node? There you go. 30. Let's see what happens. Tato done good. Tato done good. Famous last words. Good luck, everyone. And so we put the fueling port on here, and we could actually deliver a payload of fuel and refuel it and use it for another mission. Right? That's pretty cool. Okay. Retract solar panels. We've got 355. We also have 24 monoprop. This thing is holding retro. And so this is going to be, is it stable or not? And I didn't design the craft. I don't know if it's stable or not, but it's a much lower orbital velocity now. Um, so hopefully this thing can live through this. Did you serious? <laughs> you blocked the hatch. Any spare science to collect or anything? Yeah, I don't know. We need a crew report from space high. Do we have a... We could actually have a Kerbal get out of this. Let's see here. Transfer crew. Jeb down to there. EVA Jeb. Jeb can crawl up. He can take all the data out of there. He can board the vessel. Then we can do a crew report. Nah, he's already got the crew report from space high. He's fine. Blocked? The hatch is just properly sealed. <laughs> the hatch is just properly sealed, right? Okay, Jeb, well, you get back up into here then. Those EVA buttons shouldn't be enabled. That's interesting. Do y'all dare me to try and... <laughs> Do y'all dare me to... Huh. <laughs> EVA a tourist and see what happens <laughs> let's not do that <laughs> no, we'll just put tourist EVA I'm super curious ah yes so how long is it going to take this because it wasn't a 30 minute orbital period it does look to me like we're going to go long over KSC but let's let's see what we get right yeah, but usually it's disabled. Usually if the tourist isn't going to EVA, the, the tourist is, or the EVA is disabled. So we're not going to quite make the KSC. It would need, it would take some more time to actually set up the orbital phasing. It's the exact same thing. We phase our orbit and we, we manipulate our orbital period so that we are re-entering the atmosphere right when KSC is underneath us. It's a thing that we could have done. Um, the claw almost looks like stabilization fins. Nice. I don't have RCS on. I'm going to see if it re-enters successfully without the RCS. What's in action group one? I have no clue. You don't, you don't have action group one unlocked on this save yet because you're just tier two. And the uh, space plane here or, or, or VAB. So you may have bound it to like... The light, or the lights, the RCS, SAS brakes, abort. Yeah, it doesn't look like anything's bound to run all the science experiments or anything. I'm curious if this is going to stay stable or not. We're already slowing down. I kind of wanted to land at the KSC, but whatever. <laughs> I want to see if it stays stable. It is slowing down right now. The ablator is burning off. It has plenty of electric charge. It's it's nice and stable. It's not really needing to uh, use a lot of electric charge. It's literally just the gyros spinning up to keep it stable right now. But let's watch when it goes down. Oh, well, okay. There's that. It's just changed its orbit. still slowing down. Y'all watch. We're going to hit that island. <laughs> 
<laughs> We're gonna hit that island. <laughs> Twenty four hundred, we've burned through about fifty ablator. Dude, going through one point four ablator per second, it doesn't even matter. If if we use all the ablator, the heat shield is still a great heat shield even if all the ablator burns off. Yeah, this is this is neon save. This is a uh, neon heat diseases save. Still staying really nice right there on retrograde. Getting into the thicker atmosphere now. It is using a little bit more reaction control. So you see the uh, 0 0.12, 0 0.13. It's having to fight a little bit harder to stay on, but I still haven't enabled the RCS. You can see there it's starting to want to go sideways a little bit. And there it just went sideways. So not stable when it got into the thicker atmosphere. But with surface velocity down at 1800... As long as the save doesn't have the heat overlays turned off, I'm not sure if it's like not showing us, but once we get under 17, I feel good. Make sure these are the drugs. Yeah, the drugs are first. So it did, it did destabilize a little bit, but we were going slow enough that it didn't blow up. It didn't uh, overheat, and that was without the RCS even. Not too bad, we're good. I don't care if he goes to Dune or not, as long as they land safely. <laughs> Hopefully they're going to land safely. We'll wait till the drogues pop out here. We didn't quite hit that island. There we go, drogues. Oh no, they got tangled up in the claw and everybody died. <laughs> oh, let's look at this real quick. Uh, physics, arrow, display arrow data in action menus. Drag on the claw right now. It's getting 0.23 drag on the claw, but it's changing pretty rapidly. And if we disarm it, does it go down? Wow, it's all over the map. Oh, yeah, it definitely went down though. Well, now it says the drag's 1.6. 1 1.8. 1 Does the claw have less drag when it's open? <laughs> the claw has less drag when it's open. This is less draggy, 1.8, than this. So we would have been more stable if we kept the claw closed. <laughs> Oh, KSP, <laughs> you're so silly. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Seems legit. <sighs> Somebody put the values backwards is what happened. There we got the, the drugs out. We'll get it down to a thousand and we'll pop the mains. We can time warp here. So now, Neon, you're going to need to build a boat that can actually float over here to rescue these Kerbals. <laughs> Your exercise will be to build a rescue boat. <laughs> I, it would be nice if you could stage cutting drogues, because I would stage my shoots so that when the mains went, the drogues got cut. That's what I would like to do. But that should be a safe... Hopefully that's a safe landing speed for this thing. Did you test that? <laughs> Is is that a safe landing speed? A rocket powered boat, of course, yes. <laughs> or a paddle wheel, whichever. A pot has fallen into the water at Lego City. Build a recovery ship! <laughs> nice. Alright, here we come. 7.2. I don't know if we'll lose the heat shield or not. Skidoosh. Skidoosh. Oh, and it's even right side up. <laughs> so there you go we have successfully landed Jeb, Bill, and Bob plus their cadre of three tourists, Kentop, Patian and Ropont Ropont, Kerbal, back over here stage drug cut would be rad I, it would even be cool if the drugs would flutter away or something I, gosh, that would be cool but uh, Neon, we have successfully brought your Kerbals back down to the surface of Kerbin 
Uh, not particularly close to KSC. It's a couple hundred kilometers from KSC, but uh, that's that's well within recovery range, right? We, that's, we could say that that's recovery. I'm going to leave it right here, and I'll let you recover it. I will leave this craft floating here. And in your save, you also have this uh, Tugtato that is in orbit ready to do another mission. Just take it some fuel and uh, take it a payload, put the payload on the front of it, and send the tourist to Duna or something. That's a drive section for an interplanetary ship is what that is. And you can design a hab module, and you can deliver the hab module to orbit, and you can deliver fuel to orbit. You can refuel that. You can dock it to the hab because I did put that one little docking port on the front. And you can reuse the Tugtato as an interplanetary drive module for your next mission. Excellent. No, I don't. I don't think that Tugtato need two needs more thrust to weight ratio. Um, that was just a really crazy high energy burn that we did. So normally you're going to Duna. You're going anywhere. You're not doing crazy high energy burns like that. I don't know if we ever even looked what a ten ton. I mean, heck, you could you could send up that same module design. Right? You could, instead of a claw on the front, you could put a docking port on it, and you could dock that module to this thing backwards, and you could use this to go to Duna. I guarantee you that if you fill this thing up, that you'll have more than enough Delta V to get to Duna with it. I, now I want to look at this, because this is what happens to me. When did Pigtato become Tugtato? <laughs> Look, I, I want to look real quick, because that's a really capable drive section. If we open up uh, the Tugtato launch, right? And you also have a 50-ton lifter if you need to take 50 tons into orbit. But here's Tugtato, right? And we can actually make this the root node on Tugtato. Save it as a sub-assembly. Like that. Like that. And if we grab the rescue target out of there, we should be able to... Actually, I'm going to take that claw off, and I'm going to make this the root node, like that, and just literally slap another uh, docking port on it. Oop, it's the root node, so that's the thing. We'll put another docking port on it, and we'll put this up there. Right? So you could you could redesign your craft... So that, I don't know, maybe the hatch isn't blocked <laughs> as well. And this thing is rocking how much delta V? In vacuum. 4,731 delta V. You can use this drive section to go on most of the missions in Kerbin. That's pretty darn cool. <laughs> With this module and this drive section, you could you could go on just about anywhere you need in Kerbin, in the Kerbin system. And when you relaunch this thing, you probably don't even need 800. You could probably get by with 240. Nah, that's only worth like 70, 80 delta V, so whatever. But anyways. <laughs> Neon, uh, that was a really cool thing for me to solve. Um, it was something that we learned from as well, so how to set up that elliptic rendezvous where we had the elliptic orbit and we had the hyperbolic orbit and we phased them together and we made their orbital periods... We didn't have, we don't care what the orbital periods actually were. We just used the fact that it's going to take you this much time to go around this racetrack and this much time for that thing to get down to the periapsis and we set that orbital period just right so that we came around the racetrack and we met it right there. Which was uh, really cool. What's up, Torn Wings? How you doing, dude? <laughs> Tugtato is honestly the MVP. <laughs> that was a, a really cool thing to, to sort of solve, a, a mission to solve there. So, Neon, thank you so much for sharing that with me. Um, didn't answer as many random questions, but I hope that y'all learned something for the help desk. Again, uh, today's, tonight's help desk was uh, solving an impossible scenario that uh, Neon Heat Disease there sent me. I don't do that very often, and when I do it, I ask that there are no mods installed, so, so not a lot of part mods or anything like that. Um, but if you have a stock save that has some sort of wacky problem for me to solve, that was actually a lot of fun. Uh, QEDC, didn't know you could do an, capture an elliptical like that, thanks. It's, so, it's a really useful thing to do. QEDC, it's a really, really useful thing to do. Um... <laughs> As far as the tourists know, it was Neon who saved them. No knowledge of consultant dots. 
<laughs> You're a steely-eyed missile man. Nice. You're good, just lurking. I'm hanging in there. Yeah, I'm hanging in there. So, spy kills. Uh, no, I wasn't attempting a moon landing here. I was uh, doing a rescue mission. Um, and we ended up designing this part down here. Tug Tato, right? Was the rescue craft that we sent up to meet up with the rescue E craft. This is the craft that needed to be rescued. And it had a drive section on the back of it, like this, but it was empty of fuel. And so we connected them together, and then we jettisoned the drive section, and we used Tug Tato here to capture and then deorbit the other craft. And we had enough Delta V that Tug Tato is actually still up in orbit around Kerbin, so we can refuel Tug Tato and uh, use it for more missions. So many mini listens tonight. Nice, Kurosagi. Nice. But. I've been streaming now for four hours. Three hours and 51 minutes, technically. Um, but uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and call that Kerbal Help Desk for this evening. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And Neon, thanks again for, for sharing that mission with me. In the impossible scenario with the tourists that need to be rescued. Um, you still need to send that. You need to recover the craft. And you need to send that one Kerbin back to Duna. Because he's not. you got six years to get to Duna and back. Do you know how to plot interplanetary trajectories Welcome efficiently? The, and the next window, the the next uh, transfer window is and stuff. I mean, we could actually do that. We could continue on and use this as an example of how to plot an interplanetary trajectory to Duna in a future stream. <laughs> Dude, Neon Heat, thanks for the sub. <laughs> I appreciate the sub. It, it ain't like that. You don't have to sub to me for stuff like that, but I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate the sub there. <laughs> you go get your work done, whatever you're supposed to be doing. Y'all, I'm going to be shutting down the stream. Look for me tomorrow 